Welcome to Lily House, where we ask you to join us in our living room for family movie night. You may hear a dog bark, a cat meow, or a baby cry. But that's because we want this podcast to feel like an authentic evening in our home. <laughs> Sam almost dropped his entire laptop. We got it. We got it. <laughs> I have no idea how that caught on uh, okay. Mike, but we'll see. So, put on your comfiest pajamas, get cozy under a nice warm blanket, and let's talk about some movies... We originally were going to discuss uh, a film that we'll show in a later podcast, but Sam watched the wrong film uh, because of me, but (laughs) but still, but still the wrong film. I was misinformed, and uh, (laughs) I just want to get that on the record straight right now. This is an example of boys communicating with half of their brain instead of all of their brain. I don't, I don't even know. Where the other half of my brain is, is right now. I don't know where under. Gabe's other half is. I was about to say, I think I only, every day, have a single side functioning. Yeah, you wake up, you're like, mm, today's left side. Well, it's not a it's not a choice that I make. It's just something that yeah. <laughs> that is thrust upon Even me. Even better. It's like Morgan Freeman <laughs> said in, uh, in the trailer of Lucy, the Luc Besson-directed film starring Scarlett Johansson. How could I forget? Where he said, you're only using 10% of your brain. But you can use 100% of it. If you're Scarlett Johansson, Yeah, and then you either get busy living, you get busy <laughs> well, I don't think that's Lucy, but... It can be. It can, it can be if we use 100% of our brain. Yeah, protein. exactly. <laughs> oh, okay, I, I see, I see. <laughs> Joining me today, as you can already kind of tell, is my wonderful wife, Missy. Hi. With enthusiasm Hi. tonight. Hello. <laughs> Good impression of our son there. And uh, on my right, the incomparable, the insatiable. Sam. <laughs> Welcome to my town. The the town of also Lily House. Yeah. L- lest we forget. Which is yeah. uh, the podcast feed that you're listening to right now. Because we had a malfunction in planning and scheduling, we will be providing a very special episode today and that is a look back on the year 2023 as a whole for movies now this will be releasing after the new year so as the time of this recording it really feels like we're on the precipice of 2024 here as opposed to being fresh into it yeah in terms of the movie year as a whole what do you guys think of the quality of films, the sort of film landscape, cinema itself. Do you guys think that 2023 was a successful year for the art form? I think so. I think there was a, I mean, I think a big running theme with this year is kind of a death and rebirth theme. Interesting. A lot of blockbusters, I mean, especially big franchises like DC and Marvel, uh, just didn't really do well. Disney in general, you know, probably one of the biggest media conglomerates or the media, media conglomerate of the world. You know, they came out with lots of things, but I feel like there is... The audience is kind of kind of getting getting sick of some of, some of these projects because they're just kind of the same every time. And, and there was also this year, I think, was also great because a lot of older masters of their craft directors kind of got to kind of flex their muscles but then on the flip side of that you have a lot of younger talent you know like the in terms of older talent you have Miyazaki and Scorsese you know really masters of of the film industry you know like they've they've proven themselves time and time again and they show that they're not even like afraid of stopping and, and slowing down and then on the younger side you have just more you know up and coming directors like uh, Kelly Freeman Craig with uh, Are You There God It's Me Margaret and Ari Aster with Bo is Afraid things like that you could even say Greta Gerwig is Greta yeah a young director yeah I mean this is her third movie yeah as, a, as a solo yeah. director yeah. yeah yeah which is unbelievable to have that kind of success with her films I mean she you know, we will talk about it in the in the separate Greta Gerwig miniseries, but uh, she's had an unprecedented career. And I feel like, I agree with you, Sam, I think this year has, has had a lot of sort of, 
a lot of representation for very impressive careers, I would say. Miss, what do you what do you think about 2023 in terms of movies? I agree with Sam. I think it's a really cool example of the range of films that our modern cinema can make. Um, you know, I I didn't see The Boy and the Heron, um, but I feel like all of the Studio Ghibli movies have that kind of classic Miyazaki feel that kind of brings you back in time a little bit. Um, and then you get, you know, Oppenheimer, which is like a huge blockbuster film that shows what movies can do now. And I always think when I watch a movie like that, you know, what my parents would have thought when they were my age, mm. going to the movie theater and watching a movie like this, mm. they would have been blown out of their seats. So it's just, it's a cool range of filmmaking that I think is inspirational. And also, I just think that it was a really iconic year in filmmaking. I mean, we talked about this in our Oppenheimer podcast a little bit, but Barbenheimer in general was not only like such a cool thing to happen in the cinema world, but an important thing. It brought people back to the movie theaters after a global pandemic. So I think it was a really important year in filmmaking as well. Yeah, it kind of brought eventizing back to theaters in a way that I think the the sort of Avengers Infinity War and Avengers Endgame kind of made huge you start you sort of start to see some of that again here with Barbenheimer and, and I would also say to a different extent like the the Taylor Swift Eras tour towards the mm. end of the year as well the Beyonce movie yeah I mean the Beyonce movie felt like sort of a different kind of film altogether true but but i think uh in terms of i mean in terms of what we're talking about in terms of event movies i I absolutely think that's the case and and that movie definitely changed a lot of their uh (laughs) their marketing strategy after this Mm. the the news and success of of taylor swift's movie so i i definitely think that that's part of the narrative for sure uh and also the the sort of disenfranchising of superhero dominance is is definitely been a yeah. major theme throughout the year and and at the time of this recording we just had Aquaman two sort of stumble and fall in the same kind of way as uh, as previous entries in superhero franchises this year and you know it feels like a an apt way to to cap yeah. to cap off a pretty disappointing complete year for superhero stuff yeah critically and financially uh mm-hmm. you know aquaman 2 it has not done very well and that's uh the death knell for for the dceu as it was this yeah. year you know they mm-hmm. they just pumped out a lot of dc movies this year but you know a lot of people are basically over over it and they're uh over you know marvel and financially indiana jones was a movie that really bombed at the box office you know definitely not one of the most deserving but i think this year a lot of the films weren't even that bad like the marvels movie a lot of people didn't even hate but it was kind of a sign of the quality of all the other marvel movies that preceded it you know of well this one's not that bad i didn't deserve it but you know people are done being disappointed and watching uninspired filmmaking and they want to go see barbie and you know like missy said attend that event and, and that that's the event now and that's a really cool cool change in, in direction for for the year yeah and I, th- I think we'll certainly talk about this movie more as well i'm sure but but spider-man across the spider-verse kind of showed what what these kind of movies should be yeah was that 2023 it certainly was yeah that was in june oh it was in june remember we saw it on my birthday we did see it on your birthday. No, we didn't. Oh. No. <laughs> we saw it for someone's birthday, though, didn't we? Across the Spider-Verse? Wait, I'm mixing it up with um, <laughs> with the one with the three of them. Deadpool? The last Tom Holland <laughs> No one. Way Home, you're talking I'm mixing up No oh. Way Home. That was, wasn't it this December 21? Yeah, we all saw that. We saw No Way Home together. Okay. Uh, we did Gabe, all see that one together, but it wasn't you for were, birthday. You were pregnant, Missy, and then Gabe was... Also pregnant. Um, also pregnant. He was also pregnant. No, he was like extremely ill. I was. I remember that. Oh God. And we went to that diner. Oh man, I went was. To the diner afterwards. Yeah. Oh, I Holy do remember moly. that. 
Why did I... I'm, my time is just not with me anymore. <laughs> I thought that was 2023, that movie. <laughs> that was two years ago. <laughs> no, Spider-Verse, I agree. Because is, Spider-Verse, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's just like, you know, graphic artists and, you know, editors and whole teams of people just popping up and flexing their skills. I think that is just a whole accumulation of what really talented people can do that movie Mm. and i know we'll talk more about it but i think that i think that honestly people are pretty much just done with superheroes i i'm sick of superheroes personally but um you know but i wouldn't deny a movie being great if it came along yeah i mean i'm sure a lot of people share your sentiment and and i think especially with the the way that things have turned out with the Jonathan Jonathan Majors controversy and and those sorts of uh, the the sort of re reconfiguring of uh, Marvel's planning as a whole and Disney's planning as a whole that whole restructuring no. I think <laughs> sorry our dog smells our dog just let out a hellacious oh fart I can move him to I'm his dying. Bed. No, it's okay. Continue, Gabe. <laughs> Continue. We gotta, like, fumigate the room now. <laughs> He's been really gassy today. Leave him alone. <laughs> yeah, it's been it's been pretty bad. <laughs> Sam, I can move him to the other side of the room. It's okay. This is all part of the, the experience. <laughs> this is what Lily House is all about. I should have mentioned uh, dogs farting, but you can't really hear it. Unfortunately, no. yeah, Gabe, let's add that to the intro. Dogs <laughs> farting. <laughs> Dogs barking and or farting. And Sammy's pooping. Sam, yep. you're pooping? No. Oh. Not right now. <laughs> okay, not great. at the moment. Yeah, not right now. Great. Fantastic input by you. <laughs> <laughs> so let, let's kind of dive into some of the superlatives that I wanted to talk about for this let's year. Let's do it. Um, there's, there's a couple like criteria that I want to cover. Obviously, we, we want to talk about our favorite films as a whole. But I want to dig a little bit deeper um into various films i want to talk about first uh, performances i want to talk first about sort of like the most like impression performances that you guys saw this year and and while you're kind of thinking about that that question i'll get us started with um you know i i think there's a lot of obvious picks yeah for this category but i want to highlight one that's um that might be a little bit less obvious discussed i would say um and that's uh zach efron in the iron claw okay who who has been receiving a lot of claim for his performance in the movie but i think even even that is not enough uh the amount of physical transforming uh the the sort of way that he pours his heart and soul into that character while also being so physical at the same time is mm. such impressive commitment for that guy. Um, he's shown already with Baywatch. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't say it with his face. Film. That, uh, that he can commit physically to roles, especially when it comes to getting fucking jacked beyond belief. <laughs> and uh, in this movie, is certainly no exception to that, but, but his performance has so many more layers to it. Is he a chameleon? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I definitely would have a hard time being like, yeah, the guy who plays uh, Carrie Von Erich in The Iron Claw is the same guy that plays... Uh, Troy Bolton? Troy Bolton, Troy Bolton. Yeah. in High yeah. School Musical? Or Kevin Von Erich, I'm sorry. Not Carrie. Carrie's Jeremy on White. Um, I mixed up the case. But, yeah, no, I, I, I would have a hard time saying that, especially since, unfortunately, he had his jaw surgery and thing, his face looks a little different in general now yeah. than it did during high school musical time. But I think uh, I think that's that's an interesting call. I'm very excited to see if he goes into more roles like this in the future where he can really, like, flex his, uh, his acting chops. But uh, is, there any, is there any performances that you guys want to shout out to the first here? Yeah, I think uh, one that this is kind of a supporting role, but uh, Divine Joy Randolph in the Holdovers. Oh, sure, sure. Is really great in this film. Uh, I don't want to give major spoilers, yeah, but she's uh, for Missy since she hadn't seen it. And for anyone uh, who who's unfamiliar, plays, yeah. yeah, she's uh, she's been in uh, Only Murders in the Building. She sort of sh- popped up in a whole bunch of. Uh, 
random roles here and there, yeah. especially she, in television. She was in that show that the Euphoria. She was in the Idol as well. The Idol, oh, okay. as the, the sort of oh, okay. like the bodyguardish mentor, mentor character. Maybe, yeah, yeah, yeah. That that came out this year, didn't it? It, it certainly uh, it was certainly released in the year twenty twenty three. That is uh, that is a fact. Yeah, that that no, she was really. Um, I had never seen her in anything before this, so that um, this was a, a brand new role for me. And seeing her play this kind of character in grief, especially like a certain scene where, you know, she's been like drinking and and like it kind of like all the emotions like pour out of her really impacted me uh there was a couple moments in this movie that were emotionally impactful but this one just felt so real and felt like like i've had that expression before like or i've seen people with that expression and she's able to to chart the journey of of grief and kind of an, an emotional breakdown of sorts in that scene she's able to chart it so well that you know it's where it's building and you know but you're still so like devastated when it happens and uh yeah i would would say that that, that's a role that sticks out for me there's obviously more obvious ones too uh which we can discuss but yeah miss uh do you have do you have any it doesn't have to be idiosyncratic picks like ours but do do you have do you have one well the one that came to my mind as i scroll through my list of movies would probably be Robert De Niro in Killers of the Flower Moon. Mm. Oh, yeah. I think that was, like, my favorite acting performance of any of the 2023 films that I saw. I mean... Wow. I think that that movie, even though I wouldn't say it was my top... I don't know. Um, but <laughs> that movie definitely had my favorite acting performances. I think every single actor besides, like, uh, what's his name... Our friend from The Mummy, Brendan Fraser. Oh, yeah, his performance. Besides him yeah. in that movie. But, you know, Lily oh. Gladstone's amazing. Robert De Niro's amazing. Leo's amazing. But I think my favorite from that film was definitely Robert De Niro. He just plays the villain so well. And you can really see how Scorsese and him jive together. And they just have an understanding of each other and what each other can do. And, you know, it's, he plays that silent villain really, really well, where he's not necessarily screaming in your face that he's the bad guy, but you really hate him. And he does a great job of that. So I'd say that's probably my favorite. That feels like a, a, a Scorsese De Niro staple. Mm. Is, it is like the sinister nature of all of De Niro's characters in, in his movies that is very much not overt yeah i would say except for like cape fear which uh-huh. is so like obviously he's a yeah. bad guy in it, but but he, he just revels in it i think with the his other movies uh i would say especially like like casino as well i think is it's so it's so such complex characterization i think they're they're both so good at that and he's so good at portraying it uh i want to shout out some other weird ones that I think will uh, will fly under the radar a bit, but I want to give credit. Um, Awa Tabiri in Bottoms. Yes. She is uh, hilarious. Hilarious in that movie. And, uh, Miss, you didn't, want, you didn't see Bottoms. I did right? not, no. You, you probably enjoyed it. It's very similar to uh, But I'm Just a Cheerleader. Oh, that's a great movie. Yeah, th- this movie was heavily inspired by that, by that film. And he even has uh, some some references to it in uh, in the movie itself. It's it's very funny, and uh, and she's just great. In a year where Aoi Berry shows up in like everything and is also great in everything, this is yeah. definitely like on top. She's do- she's become one of my oh, favorite. I farted again. Oh Jesus Christ! Was it you? No. Oh. <laughs> no, that was our dog again. I'm gonna move him. <laughs> she's a uh, Aoi Berry is is becoming one of my favorite actresses in general um <laughs> yeah please our our son is being ejected yeah, was, from the couch it's painful like in the line of fire he's going across right the now. now good boy good boy Cloudy. you release your fumes over there oh my god <laughs> seems like dying over here <laughs> oh look at his face he's embarrassed 
It's okay, honey. It happened. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he is aware of what's going on confused. here. He's a little confused. <laughs> He's got quite a puppy face. Okay, so let's. So, uh, yeah, so like I was yeah, saying. Yeah, so <laughs> Anna Beery, continue. So, uh, yeah, she's becoming definitely one of my favorite actresses. She was great in Bottoms, uh, uh, you know, alongside Rachel Sennett, you know, in that lead of course, role. Of course. And Theater Camp, she's really funny. She's very funny. As, like, in a camp too. supporting kind of character. And, and she's just been showing up in everything. Obviously, The Bear, which is, um, you know, in the TV show realm, but that show is one of my favorites um, in the past couple years in general she's amazing in that yeah she's one of the the driving forces of that show and for sure and then even like she's done like just random stuff she shows up and she was in uh abbott elementary this year um Mm -hmm. as like a guest star and i love that show as well so she's just working with like the right people and and uh you know she's uh paul what's happening (laughs) (laughs) just slammed her leg on the (laughs) ottoman And, uh, you know, and she posted pictures with uh, Paul Mescal, and I hope they make a movie together, because I love, they're, like, two of my favorite new people in Hollywood, and yeah, I, I no, love them. Yeah, I have no clue what that movie would look like, but that would be I hope cool. it exists at some point. <laughs> that would be cool. Um, I also want to mention uh, Chloe Grace Moretz in Nimona. Which was oh, a yeah. which was a um, a very cool animated film on Netflix. That uh, I like that movie. Yeah, that she just did a really good job in. Miss, do you have any other ones you wanna wanna shout out? While Sammy and I are here talking about movies you haven't seen. <laughs> this one's a little unhinged, <laughs> but I really loved Chris Pine. Oh, in that's, Dungeons no, Dragons. yeah. Oh, that is. He was I, great in that. I, I don't think that's unhinged at all, actually. I know it's like, you know, it's a silly, fun movie. It's not a high stakes movie, whatever. But Chris Pine, that's the role that he, I love him in. That's yeah. the type of role. The witty hero that, you know, the charming, blah, blah, blah. Like, Sarcasm the kind of, tris- the ass kind of. <laughs> yeah, the kind of tricky, sarcastic, but charming and gentleman. You know, like, he does that really well. Um,. So I love that role. I even loved... I, I always forget his name um, from Bridgerton. Oh, yes. Let me get let me get the exact name because he has multiple names. He was also in Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, and I, yeah. Do you know how to pronounce his name? Is it Reggie? Reggie Jean Page? I don't know. I think it's more like French sounding. Réjean Page. I don't know. It's something <laughs> fun like that. Oui, oui, monifique. But he's, mm. he, was, he was a role, and this is how I know I liked his performance in it. I wish there was, like, quadruple the amount of him in that movie. Yeah, I thought he was doing a lot more, but he, he doesn't yeah, he's end kinda, up really being there He's, like, a anyone. special attraction in that film. Yeah. A little bit. A little bit. But yeah, he's I, used well. Yeah, that was another movie where I really liked the performances a lot. I think that's a great choice. I have to, I got to shout out um, Glenn Howerton. Um, oh, Blackberry from it's yeah. yeah the the star of Dennis and it's always sunny in Philadelphia he's always speaking of unhinged he's definitely a that's a an great, unhinged guy certainly a in great that way movie. to yeah to identify even if you haven't seen him this that's all you really need to know okay it's just an unhinged man <laughs> yeah <laughs> what about Ryan Ryan Reynolds and Free Guy. Wait, no, Ryan not Reynolds? Ryan Reynolds. <laughs> what movie was he? Oh, Ryan Gosling. Ryan missing? Gosling. Oh, one of my favorite performances. As yeah. as the Ken. He eats up every scene. He is ab- absolutely a show still stealer with yeah. Barbie. Yeah, he really is. He really, which is so funny, because it feels like such an antithesis of what the film actually is trying well, to say. People, there's been discourse <laughs> of people saying that that like. Ryan uh, Gosling kind of stealing the movie is like hurt hurts the movies and the point of the film. I don't really agree. I don't think it hurts it, but I think it's funny. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it doesn't change how how effective the movie is. I also you know? think that that's something his character was trying to do. Yeah, exactly. Get more attention. That's what his whole character was. Trying that's a to that's do. a good point. That's a good point. So I would say that he accomplished his mission and he did it really well. Yeah. He went method. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> in all of his interviews, he was talking about being a can. <laughs> <laughs> he's still method right now. He's still, he's still <laughs> can. He's now. releasing music. Yeah, yeah he did just release edition. that EP. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, all right, so I want to pivot a little bit uh, into... Because we could talk about performances all day. True. There's so many good performances from this year. Yeah. We didn't even we didn't even talk about like uh, a million movies that we probably all seen but haven't talked about in, on, <laughs> in this conversation. So let's let's pivot a little bit and talk about sort of like our favorite scenes mm. from this year. So when when you think about are like singular moments in in certain movies like like for me in in past lives the ending sequence Uh. without getting into spoilers is uh is incredibly beautiful and and like just like thoroughly analyzing every emotion that you could possibly have in that moment and really gives it so much time to breathe in the best possible way um and feels like really the best way that they could have ended the movie in general. Yeah. I like, could not think about a better way for that movie to end. So that's what I would start with. Miss, is there anything that comes to your mind when uh, when I prompt you? <laughs> I think about America Ferreira's monologue in Barbie. Oh, yeah. Mm. Incredible writing. That's a great scene. Yeah. And, yeah. and her delivery of it, too, feels so, so like, well-considered yeah. also. Yeah. Well, and I didn't say her for the performances because actually I don't love a lot of her acting choices in Barbie. For most of it. Yeah. <laughs> but that scene, her big monologue at the kind of towards the end of the film is amazing and she does it so well and you can tell she feels and agrees with every oh, word her character is for saying. Sure. Mm. And, you know, as a woman, that monologue and scene really hits me to the core. So I appreciated that scene and I thought it was well done. Yeah, it's, it's definitely, that scene's placed perfectly because it's kind of a turning point where, you know, for kick in the butt for Barbie to kind of, for them to develop, you know, a solution and kind of get to the, the third act of the movie. And, yeah, basically a literal reality check. Yeah. <laughs> in a very interesting way. What about you, Sam? Uh, scene for me, um, you know, I know I was just, we are just shit on Marvel, but... Guardians of the Galaxy Volume Three came out this year, which, which is actually a good movie. Which is an actual good <laughs> good movie, and I think um, an exception to the more, Marvel thing, just because yeah. it's you know I kind of view it also as just kind of the James Gunn proper you know property. But uh, there's a hallway a hallway action fight scene in that film uh, that's to the song of No Sleep Till Brooklyn. I mean, mm. Beastie Boys are a little overused these days, but. I still really think it fit perfectly and it's just an amazing I felt like I was watching like a video game like I was literally like my grinning from ear to ear during this scene just like everyone's like being badass and it's just it's exactly what I want from like this type of movie and also like the conclusion of a trilogy that like James Gunn still had en- like enough in the tank to give us like a, a proper conclusion to these characters and make them all look like cool like action badass superheroes like which you know is like it gave me the feeling that i want to have every time i watch a superhero movie you know like that kind of like i'm a kid again like i'm a child watching this so that's definitely a a notable one for me yeah that's a great choice that's a great choice i know neither of you have seen have seen this film uh yet but in the zone of interest there is a there's a moment where the film kind of breaks away from its its uh it's sort of main timeline mm. towards the end and it's probably the best use of like that kind of storytelling device in a, in a um, narrative film that I've ever seen wow it, it's like it jumps forward in time yeah and in a really like powerful and, and, and incredible way uh, that in most cases I would find really hokey mm. and and kind of contrived but with with this felt like so apt and so like beautifully woven into the into the the final uh, like 15 20 minutes of that movie is just a real real brilliant stroke um is there any other ones that we want to want to shout out yeah i mean there's missy has literally no other films that she wants to shout out <laughs> there's definitely a lot of 
of great, great scenes. I mean, Oppenheimer. I mean, there's like a bunch in that one for sure. Like the oh, the bleacher scene. Yeah, the bleacher speech oh, yeah. scene for sure. The Trinity test itself. Yeah, the um, you know, the scenes in Killers of the Flower Moon too. Uh, one where you know a character's kind of like an afterlife. Oh uh, yeah. You know, scene and not mm-hmm. to get into specifics, but it was it was so like quietly powerful and beautiful it really um yeah i don't know it really that scene still sticks in there and it's like in my it's like in my brain just forever it's like in there and it's and then the john wick chapter four the top down scene where he's he's shooting that cool ass shotgun it's a sweet and sweet everyone's scene. setting again set on fire i was like this is so cool it's it's absolutely unreal filmmaking yeah it's it really, really it's like it's like top down as John Wick is going through with basically like a gun flamethrower. <laughs> and it's, it's all one shot, so the chore- choreography is unbelievable. And it's just like looking down as he's going through this like maze of rooms in this building. Unbelievable stuff. I mean, he's just sh- shotgunning people, but the, it, it's like a flame shotgun. Yeah, that, so just send people on fire. That and movie, awesome. oh my god, that movie has a lot of good stuff. Yeah, there's like a lot of the, too, the, the, stair, the, the stairs. Stair, the staircase, and... the... the uh, the scene earlier with a sort of like raid on the the Japanese hotel. To, yeah. um, oh my gosh, there are so many good ones, so many good ones. Um, for me, this is this is going to be a, a take that I'm sure no one else has ever said on a, on a movie best of 2023 podcast. Okay. <laughs> but the the little date in Elemental that they have where uh, they go uh, underground to see the. I forget what the name of the flower is, but there's there's such a great moment where they they come back up from the the subway and they you know they finally touch for the first time and and the, it, there's such a beautiful like fusion of the visuals with the the, the sweeping music and mm. oh man it just it just blows me away every time I watch it. Uh, no I one really that. likes that movie, which is weird. <laughs> but we love that. Yeah, movie. I don't. I I find it to be a, a weird take. Um, but I think people get really wrapped up in like the, the like oh this is so obvious like mm. the 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 the, co- the social commentary the is so yeah, obvious, and to that I say uh, this is a Pixar film. <laughs> you know, not every Pixar film is going to be, be uh, like this like existential crisis situation mm. with uh, very like yeah exactly like you said like nuanced critique of uh, American and <laughs> human life as a whole. Um, especially when we're talking about the director of The Good Dinosaur. <laughs> this guy's not exactly, like, you know, really, like, one of the, like, crazier writing lines yeah. of uh, <laughs> Pixar. The Good Dinosaur. <laughs> I, Even with that, yeah. I don't think it's a badly written film either. Elemental? Yeah. No, I, I don't think so either. I think I think it works as, like, a a romantic comedy starter pack mm. for like younger audiences yeah which i think is uh, which is the audience that they're targeting right right i think i think w- using that vision of it for me has made me enjoy the movie like a hundred times more okay. <laughs> like every time i watch it now it just feels like a like a warm blanket comfort movie now because mm. i just think about it like you know this is sort of like a, a template yeah, you know, th- this is the baseline kind of situation for a movie like this. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't hurt to just make a pleasant film. Yeah, you know, that's how I feel. I mean, I haven't seen Elemental yet, but I definitely feel like that way about uh, Luca, that Pixar movie. I I really enjoy that movie a lot, and I feel like that movie is just a vibe. Like that's just it is, it is definitely a vibe. It's though. just like that's yeah. it. Like there's not much to it, but it's a vibe. And I um I gotta see Elemental though. Definitely, it's it's on my my watch list for for 2023. Yeah, I, re- I definitely. I definitely recommend it, um, even though the the primary thought is that it's a, it's low tier Pixar. <laughs> Big rip. So let's uh, let it, let's shift a little bit because we've been very positive on this podcast so far. I would say <laughs> let's uh, let's shift gears a little Negatives. bit. Negatives. Was there was there a film that that you guys saw that you were like especially disappointed by? Like, you had expectations about it. Mm. And then after watching it, you were like, oh. 
<laughs> yeah, I think I have like one that immediately comes to mind, and it's not even a bad movie. It's yeah. still a good film. What's that? But the Mission Impossible uh, Dead Reckoning uh, Part One. Yeah, yeah. I just think because Mission Impossible Fallout was such a high for the franchise, and also like I just think that movie's like perfect. Like I watch it, and I'm like, wow, like every action scene is great, and like the drama's there, and like Henry Cavill is the villain. But Dead Reckoning Part One, I think I, I just was expecting that 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 high again, and it gave it at some times. I mean, there's some really great action scenes in Mission Impossible, like the train sequence. Obviously, him with the bike going off the the cliff is is brilliant. But there's like story choices in this, and I I'm not like totally sold on the artificial intelligence direction that this movie's like plot takes. You know takes so i you know i don't know i just i really just i think i just had such high expectations and it wasn't able to meet that but it's still like a solid movie yeah i agree miss is there one that that you had that came to mind well you see my brother-in-law sam (laughs) oh boy who happens to be in the room what (laughs) scared he gave this movie a three and a half and this movie was called No Hard Feelings. Oh. And, you know, he saw it, and he came over, like, that day or something, and he was like, yeah, it was good, it was funny, it was, you know. <laughs> so, you know, Gabe, Gabe and I watched the movie expecting just, like, you know, not a bad movie, but your standard comedy. I could probably say that's one of the worst comedy films I've seen in a very oh long God. time. <laughs> Oh which, my god. Which Lordy. is, wow. you know, I'm not a huge Jennifer Lawrence fan, so maybe that's just me, but I didn't think the writing was good. I thought that it just wasn't funny. I didn't think any of the performances were that good. I was just, I was expecting a, you know, just mid-comedy movie, just a, you know, whatever, another comedy movie came out. Okay. But this was just a bad movie. Wow. So I dedicate that review to my brother-in-law, Sam. Samuel. Do you have a retort for that, Sam? Yeah, so I definitely don't... I don't know if it's a three and a half out of five, which is what I gave it originally. <laughs> so you're, you're actually doubling back now. Seven you're, out of ten. You're backing up. Well, I'm backing, I'm backing... I'm backpedaling with the, the score. But I still think it's a, a, an enjoyable co- comedy, raunchy comedy. Yeah. Um, I, I like raunchy comedies. I think Jennifer Lawrence really put a lot into this movie. Like, the scene where she's nude and she's fighting people on the beach. But that scene's cool. I like that. Yeah, so, you would like that scene. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, I think I think J-Law, you know, she went in this direction of, like, I can do this, like, raunchy comedy. Like, I can be the lead and, and really carry this film. And, you know, I, I enjoyed it. Like, I'm not going to rush back and watch it a second time, but if it's one of those movies, like, you know, it's on TV, you put it on in the background, and that's it. Well. <laughs> well. We'll just have to agree to disagree. I guess so. I also want to bring up another movie that I was a little disappointed in. Hmm. Was, unfortunately, The Little Mermaid live action that came out. Oh, yeah, speak on it. I, you know, obviously our generation grew up with animated Disney films, and I'm sure I sound like a boomer when I say this, but I just, you know, I think nothing beats the animated version, so that of course already taints my view, but even then, I didn't find the Little Mermaid movie to be um, the quality that I was expecting it to be with modern Disney. You know, I was expecting, like, the colors in the ocean to be vibrant and beautiful. And to me, the movie pretty much felt dull. Mm, a lot of gray. Lots of gray. Lot like, of gray. the coral reef. And, <laughs> you know, and it's not like they were trying to portray, like, a dead coral reef. There was, like, animals... Or, an, it's not brimming animals. with life. It's, yeah, they're, it's the Under the Sea song, where everybody's, like, happy and, like, singing and dancing. And it's just dull-looking. Um, that was okay. that, that scene too was like the closest thing that the movie had to to recapturing that kind of feeling of like colorful, lively, energetic ocean. Yeah, 
Yeah. And then it, it was such a stark contrast to, like, the entire rest of the movie. The land was really pretty, like, the towns and stuff. I wanted that color in the ocean. Um, some performances I wasn't crazy about. Um, some of the songs they added, or I guess, like, the two songs they added, or one, I don't even remember. But I wasn't crazy about the added songs. So for me, you know, I wouldn't say it was a bad movie. I just didn't think it was a quality remake of such a classic and beloved animated film. So, so Sam, I just want I just want a yes or no on this one. Did you watch The Little Mermaid? I've seen the original. Okay. I have not seen the remake. You haven't seen the new one. Okay. Because what I was going to ask you was, when you well, I, actually, this is perfect. When you watch the original Little Mermaid film. When was it? When when did you watch it? Was it recently or uh, a few years I, I ago? I probably watched it within the past like two years, which okay. was the first time I watched it. I, I've historically uh, been a, uh, in this family and been a person that has a really not great track record of like watching Disney movies. But I'm getting mm-hmm. better. I've watched most of the essential ones now. Okay, Little Mermaid was one of the ones I watched in that in that marathon. Okay, so so when when you watched the original Little Mermaid. One of your takeaways was it that you wanted to know more about Prince Eric? Um, not really. <laughs> well, well, let me tell you something. Oh, okay, <laughs> whether you like Continue. it or not, there is an additional hour of the Little Mermaid de- basically dedicated to Prince Eric. Immediate. That's the thing. I immediately had an interest in this movie when I I just checked the runtime. I looked up the movie on Google and it said like over two hours. I'm like, what? I'm not gonna watch this movie. <laughs> I'm not watching a Little Mermaid movie that's over two hours. It's an unbelievable amount of time. It feels really long. Yeah, you feel it so hard. It's very bizarre. I really don't understand it. The only the only live action remake of a Disney movie that I've seen is the Aladdin one, and Jungle Book. But I don't really. (laughs) That's weird. I don't lump in Jungle Book. Very bizarre. Kind of like the first one. I forgot about it. Aladdin was though. It was fine. It was, meh. It wasn't the original. But it yeah. wasn't bad. It, it's so amazing how nothing it is. Yeah. I, that's what I would say. About it's it. just lifeless. And after I saw that Aladdin one, I was like, I don't, I don't know. I'm just assuming I'm going to get the same thing in all the other ones. Yeah. I, uh, the one credit that I would give Little Mermaid is I would say that uh, Halle Bailey uh, definitely brings it in a good way. Yeah, I've, I've her voice sounded amazing. And like the clips I've seen. Yeah, if we want to talk about like one of the worst performances of the year, though, Javier Bardem in this film might as well have been made of cardboard. Really? Like wow. he, he oh, is. Oh yeah, he was King Trident. Hilariously awful. Damn. Like unbelievably bad. That sucks. <laughs> I was like, I could not believe. I could be like okay. the performance from no, this guy. He was pretty bad. Mm. I could. I, it, was, it was so bizarre. I don't know if it was a directing issue or or his like angle on the character. It was just really really bad hmm. like really bad <laughs> i could not could not get over it um i was uh i was disappointed by five nights of freddy's really i'll be honest because when i when i saw well listen right my my expectations <laughs> for the film i should preface it's not exactly like they were high or yeah anything. it's gonna be a, a it, like this is gonna be a great film anything. i at the very least expected like oh this will be fun you know jim henson company is committing to making these things close to the games it feels like there was a real attention to detail for the games and and the sort of like storyline that they put together and there are certainly elements of that in the film you know alluding to the stories that are told throughout the games it's just it's just not like it doesn't take that fun mm. that I wanted from it and use it. It feels like they they were way too focused on I would say the wrong things. Mm. Like the Josh Hutcherson character. He's, he's got way too much going on. It is so unnecessary. <laughs> Unbelievably unnecessary amount of stuff. I also don't... The, he's meant to be like this, this guy with like anger issues and then like a, like a a short temper and it doesn't really go anywhere for most of the movie it, but he's just always mad and i just don't see you know kind of short not yeah. very intimidating looking josh Hutcherson being like 
this mean like bully <laughs> guy you know it just do i don't it's not sold to me you're being mean freddy so like when i was watching like the trailers i was like oh okay they got someone kind of like a normal dude mm. which makes sense you know you don't really know that i mean they sort of get into like who the guy is in subsequent sequels of the games but you know at the, in the first one obviously you don't really know anything about this guy yeah. who you're playing as He's just the security guard who gets the job. But for some reason, they felt the need to, like, really, like, make a story out of this guy. Then they bring in the frickin'... <sighs> the younger sister. Oh, God. And you know how I feel about young kid performances. Oh, no. Oof. Achilles heel for you. Oh, man. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, man. Is the sister the, the, the blonde... Uh, officer or is that just a no no character? she's she's another character who's like the mon most unrealistic woman i've ever seen in a why movie why is there so many characters in it shouldn't it just be one person and like make it like super bare bones i feel like it's weird that that's a way to do it but there was too much real budget for this movie uh, okay. so they're like we gotta make this a film film but the game is just the guy <laughs> right it's it. very simple it's very simple it's just the job yeah they should have just kept i feel like they should have just kept it i mean i didn't see it but it's well, Captain Morgan. Well, the issue like is at, at this point the games have been going on for so long. There have been so many sequels that have created a lore. Mm. I mean, they're, the amount of videos that are like over two hours long, talking about like the lore of Five Nights at Freddy's. The, the, literally, there's multiple. Yeah, it's very it's so <laughs> over deep. two hours. So deep. So I'm sure a lot of that was like we need to to give credit to all the people that spent way too much time learning about this, the real story at the root of this these, this franchise. Yeah. And it just really fucked the movie up. Honestly. <laughs> <laughs> it really fucked it up. Damn. Um, yeah, so I was pretty disappointed in that one. Um, anything anything else missed that, uh, that you want to highlight that you felt you wanted more from? Or, or was it basically, like, encapsulated in Little Mermaid? Um, you know, I think that No Hard Feelings and Little Mermaid were my obvious <laughs> ones. You know, there were movies I gave three stars to, but I think that was just a, my taste in films versus the quality of the film. Yeah, which I'm excited to, to talk about after this. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think mostly the rest was... A lot of movies are kind of just what I expected when I saw them. I saw Renfield, and Re Re Renfield was was good. It was fun, but it definitely had this kind of plot line with Aquafina's character that wasn't really... It felt very shoehorned, and the movie kind of felt like it was getting in its own way a bit by like adding this storyline where it could have just been like straight up Nicolas Cage being like bad shit which there was a little bit of that in there but it could have been could have been a lot more exciting but it was still it was still a fun movie though and, and then I'll say Napoleon as well I was expecting it to just be a I wasn't expecting it to be great or anything but I thought it'd be a little more entertaining but there's at certain points in the movie where I was, I was just a little bit. I was just waiting for that movie to end. I was <laughs> like, please end this movie. I feel like we're starting to get to an era where like that becomes a running theme with a lot of movies. Let's shoehorn in Aquafina. <laughs> True. <laughs> Especially in like, I mean, comedies, yes, but but also like voiceover. Yeah, she's in like so many things. She's in a ton of stuff. It's crazy. It's getting like too much now. Yeah, Missy, Missy and I a few days ago saw Migration. Oh, is she in that? She does pop up in she that plays as the New York a, City pigeon. As a pigeon. Oh wow! Or she gets to use more of a Brooklyn accent, which, which is she sounded uh, good doing. Which is very much like her, you know. That I mean, that's where she was born and raised, and yeah. so it's very much like a part of her. Uh, so it felt appropriate. It was definitely the most that she like augmented her voice for a voiceover role. Okay. But then you get shit like her work in The Little Mermaid or, or Ryan the Last Dragon, if we're talking like before 2023. Yeah. And it's just kind of like... D does using this voice lend anything to this character? And most of the time, the answer is no. They kind of, they did that. <laughs> it was a little bit like that with Taika with TV too. They, they started putting him in a lot of voice roles. Mm. And I, well, him in his own movies as well. But 
Um, and it was kind of, I felt like it was a similar thing where, like, it's his voice and, like, the person is so, like, recognizable, you yeah. know, and that's kind of, like, the only, that's the only reason they were casted. Oh, uh, speaking of disappointing miss, did you know that Taika Waititi came out with a movie this year? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> that is all you need to know about the film Next Goal Wins. <laughs> oh, you were excited about that movie. I, I was. <laughs> Yeah, for like three years. Damn. Because they, they had filmed it, and then it was going to come out in 2020. Oh, and they got delayed. Like, yeah, and it was yeah. like all Elizabeth Moss and and uh, Michael Fassbender are in a Taika Waititi movie, and this was like right after just Jojo Rabbit. So I was mm. like, okay, all right, I'm excited to see like how this guy evolves as a filmmaker. And, uh, <laughs> huh. Maybe I'm glad that it fizzled out for me <laughs> maybe i'm glad it took a while after all because that was tough yeah that was, that's uh, uh, that was fucking uh, tough <laughs> what a fall from grace yeah was uh let, let, let's pivot around again uh let's just get a little more positive um were there any movies that surprised you guys in a good way that you came out and you were like hey that's pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> That's pretty good. Uh-oh. I'll start off um, <laughs> if... Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Miss. Did you have one? No, you can go. Okay. Uh, I'll just say quickly, uh, as, as to not cut you off for too long, Miss, that um, I was really surprised by Godzilla Minus One. Mm. I, I'm, as anyone close to me knows, a huge, huge Godzilla guy seen every uh studio released godzilla film that's ever been made uh i love all of them in different ways <laughs> for sure for sure in different ways um and godzilla minus one is such a cool addition to the lineage it's the i think the 70th was it the 70th anniversary of godzilla so yeah 70th exactly so and and this movie feels like such a great encapsulation of like the 70 years of Godzilla it kind of goes back to that same time period that the original was released in very different kind of context a little more blockbustery but very entertaining great effects uh, and actually really good storyline to go along with all the like Godzilla carnage that really was effective and and uh and fun to follow I was just I was really uh really taken by the film in in a in a in the best possible way i'm, ex- I'm excited to see it I'm, uh, yeah i we'll highly it recommend it well i'm glad that you liked it because that's an important franchise for you yeah there there was a lot of writing on it and i was still surprised by how much i enjoyed it is what i would say because nice. i kind of came into it with like you know i love this ip i don't know anything about this film yeah <laughs> so it <laughs> So when the little graphic at the very beginning of the movie was like 70th anniversary Godzilla, I was like, ooh, whoa, snap! Even more <laughs> to like, even more weight to put on the the shoulders of this film. Yeah. That uh, that honestly, it it met. I was very happy. They put more pressure on themselves at the beginning <laughs> of the film. Yeah, oh, yeah by setting that seven there. Yeah, because I I know I completely forgot about that statistic. Un- until they reminded me. I would say that... Um, that a film that I was surprised at how much I enjoyed it would be the Super Mario movie. Mm. I can feel Gabe and Sam and their judgment of me for loving this movie so much. <laughs> but, you know, Gabe, Gabe and I went to see this movie... We got a babysitter. We were like, oh, well, we both love video games. We both obviously had childhoods with Super Mario. It's probably not great because it's Illumination. Gabe hates the Minions. You know, <laughs> that was minions. kind of like... Just me. I Just I hate the Minions. <laughs> that, so that's kind of what I was thinking going in. But, I mean, you can vouch for this, Gabe. Like, I haven't been beaming with just fun joy coming out of a film as I did with that movie. I really didn't expect it to hit as hard as it did. 
And, you know, I think a lot of it is nostalgia. For sure, for sure. And, but, you know, for nostalgia to be effective, it has to be done well. And I found that movie did it really, really well. And I just, I haven't had that much fun in a movie theater in a long time. And I just was beaming and I, like, couldn't stop referring it to people to just go and have fun with it. And I wasn't expecting myself to feel that way about that movie. But I really, really did have fun with it. Yeah, that there was a beautiful energy coming off of uh, watching that movie. <laughs> it, was, it was really special. Um, even from the very opening moments of it, we both kind of looked at each other. You know, when with the the sound coming in, there there was something about listening to this to that original score from mm-hmm. Mario and on the big screen that really kind of like made us emotional just like at the outset and it was just for like nintendo's opening for the movie (laughs) it wasn't even related to the actual film yet uh there's there's a lot of like i would i would say illumination decisions that were made in this movie uh that i think hold it back for me but for the most part i had a really fun time with it like really fun and and i similarly i i was surprised in a good way by how much I, I enjoyed my time with it. Uh, as someone who's a big fan of Donkey Kong, I thought uh, Seth Rogen, Seth Rogen was, was very fun. Uh, I was I had no clue what to expect with, <laughs> with yeah, that combination of performer and character, but but I but I enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, even Chris Pat, I wasn't really that bothered by, even though he's just talking normally, basically. <laughs> I. I, I really wasn't too uh, too concerned with it. I think the 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 visual style you can tell that Illumination like really wanted to to make this a an impressive looking movie, you know, sort of like above average for their usual kind of um not not to say that their their stuff recently has looked terrible, but it's definitely not, you know, Pixar level expectations. Yeah. Here. It was still beautiful though. Well, that well, that's what I'm saying. It exceeds what Illumination usually puts out with their movies in a way uh, that I think felt like a, re- a very cool ele- elevation of their work. Um, and you can tell how special it it, it was uh, to that studio to put it together. And, yeah. And how seriously Nintendo took it as a collaboration, also. You know, and you could feel that in the score and the and the look of it. Yeah. No. I I I know like seems like i hate the movie but i don't i actually like the movie i think it's a fun time i think i just there's the critical hat you know i can put on for the film and Mm -hmm. and pick it apart but you know i also grew up with mario and the sounds they put in and you know it's just it's it's surreal to to know that this exists like this came out now you know that there's a, a movie an animated mario movie like them doing their thing and and get getting you know and i think getting jack black as bowser is a huge plus for me especially i love jack black most people do he's kind of hard to hate jack black so (laughs) and they really i think they really make use of him extremely well by giving him you know the peaches song which i think is you know such a, a fun extremely catchy song like that was just stuck in my head for months and months you know um and yeah, so I think, yeah, Chris Pratt, he wasn't really that bad. Anya Taylor-Joy was good as Peach, and and uh, what's it called? Who was Toad again? Uh, Keegan-Michael Key oh, was, was Toad. Great. I love that. I love that casting as well. So I'm excited, and I hope, you know, I hope they at least try to, you know, put as much passion in this one that they do for, for the next one. Try to make it, you know, even as the same pulsating rhythm, just keep going with it. Try not to slow it down. One? Yeah, that's what I think my greatest fear is. I mean, the movie... Yeah, they're going to make it. They teased Yoshi at the end. Spoilers. <laughs> uh... The movie made over a billion dollars. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it's illumination. And it's illumination. So, I think that it's it's very clear that they will be making a sequel to Mario. They'll probably be making spin-off films of other characters. There's already a talk about a live-action Zelda... So in yeah, general, that's, that's, yeah. in general, Nintendo as a whole is digging more into 
uh, films as a medium for their work as in general. But I'm sure in terms of the Illumination Nintendo combo, I can definitely see them continuing to to make more films. Uh, there was a joke going around. I'm not sure how serious it is or not, but that uh, that they would do like a Super Mario or a, a Super Smash Bros. movie oh to gosh. sort of be like their oh, Avengers. Oh yes, I did hear which those. is hilarious to think about. That'd be funny. Very funny to think about. Um, Triggered. Yeah, I have no <laughs> clue. It's, it's going to be a crazy world that we yeah. live in when that movie comes out. I I I, I don't even know what I'm going to do with myself. But. Yeah, the the live action Zelda alone like that. I think that's confirmed actually and. In- yeah, directed, directing, uh, being directed by the guy uh, who made the Maze Runner films, Les yeah, Ball. which is kind of concerning, but... What are they going to do with Link? Is he just going to go, huh? They may, st- <laughs> they may start giving him dialogue, no, which he's gonna would talk. be terrible. He's, he's going to talk. And I'm not happy about it, but whatever. We'll see what happens eventually, whenever that would come out. Yeah, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. I mean... Wes Ball, the, the guy who's been slated to direct the movie, has said that this is, like, the passion project film for him. So I have faith that he's at least going to, like, have an appreciation for the source material. My hope is that he's allowed to use his knowledge and love for the source material on the finished product. Very true. That, uh, that's a very different story when, uh, when we're discussing, like, filmmakers' original intention for a project versus what actually ends up yeah. happening on screen uh so we'll uh we'll we'll see <laughs> again we'll cross that bridge when we come to it as well but uh sam for you is there any that uh any films you watch this year that you were pleasantly surprised by in a positive way we mentioned dungeon and dragons i think that definitely was one. Oh, for sure i think um, for all three of us that's uh that's a pick yeah i mean i, I thought it was gonna be like i looked at the trailers i was like this is probably gonna be like a mid type of movie and kind of it'll go into the radar and just kind of fade away into the ether but instead it was you know i was getting really good word of mouth and then i was like i should really go check this out and then you know i got i went to see it and i really was like just it was funny like it was just a funny movie and it was like consistently funny all the characters kind of actually had like their own like arcs and like time to shine you put hugh grant in there as like you know the villain he was great it's such a good choice because hugh grant's kind of like a you know like kind of a grumpy you know piece of shit anyway <laughs> so like wow. you, kinda, you put him in a strong word vill- i just watch all these videos about hugh grant and he's apparently terrible on set in like every movie so that's why I'm saying he's, but he's, like, he's definitely a prima donna actor, yeah for sure. well, but i kind of love him he plays in that movie oh Sorry, Riku. <laughs> I really hope that picked up. Oh my god. I really hope that picked up on the, He's like, right. on the recording. My cat yelled at me because I moved the pillow he's leaning on. Oh my god. That was hilarious. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that is a surprisingly like solid movie. Yeah, like it was just... And the action was like good. Like I don't entertaining. I... I miss, I'm sure you'll remember when we were watching it. I was dying when the fat dragon showed up you love oh. the fat dragon like it's legitimately you. legitimately <laughs> one of the best cgi characters i've seen this year yeah just like from the look of him from like the movement the scene that he's in i was just like i want to see everything of this character ever <laughs> i just i was loving it the fat dragon was funny. He's so silly. I just he's love so the scene goofy. where they they like do the the spell where he's trying to play, and then like Chris Pratt's like face gets like Chris uh, Pratt. Or Chris, <laughs> Chris very Hem- different. Chris Hemsworth. Film. No, I'm joking. Chris Hemsworth. <laughs> also very so different. Somebody Chris's. Uh, yeah, Chris Pine's face gets like just like stretched out, and he's like, Ooh, he's like glitching out or whatever. Yeah, yeah. That that scene is just so funny. Every major Chris was. Uh, was active this year. That's true. Hemsworth. Yeah. Was Interesting in... when you think about that. What was Hemsworth in? Oh, wait, was Hemsworth not in something? I think he was in Extraction 2. Oh, yes, he was. Yeah, that right, came out right. this he, year. Which I heard was solid. Um, Chris Evans was in, uh, aside from Scott Pogram Takes Off, he was in <laughs> uh, uh, Ghosted with Ana de Armas. Oh, yeah. You, fami- you familiar with this, uh, this one? I feel like I've it... heard of it. It seemed like it was written by like an artificial... 
intelligence. Bot. That was sort of the consensus was that it, mm. it was AI generated, um, and it probably was the most lifeless thing they came up with this year. Was was the consensus? Um, and then we got Chris Pine, and obviously Chris Pratt. Yeah, Chris too. Pine. Everybody's uh, everybody's calling into work. Pretty, yeah, pretty cool. Chris Nolan. Nature is healing. Yeah, Chris Nolan. <laughs> Nature's healing. <laughs> Um, oh, there was I had one that's in my tongue that I was gonna talk about. Oh well, uh, past lives in general I think uh, was a massive surprise just in terms of like I had no expectations mm. at Sundance. This was a uh, the first feature from Celine Song, so you know you never really know what to expect with these sort of like first time filmmakers making a movie in Sundance, and yeah, it, it's always kind of a toss up. Like, is this gonna be something? Is this gonna be nothing? And uh, I was very, uh, I was way more captivated by the film than uh, than I thought. And when I saw it, I it was accompanied by a, a conversation with um, with Celine Song and uh, John Magaro, the one of the actors in the film. No, he's great. Uh, and I was really, really taken by by how she talked about the film and and how uh, studied she was and. And uh, and her influences of the film was also very telling, of sort of like the like the James L. Brooks kind of romantic mm. dramedies of uh, the past and things like that. I gave me a different kind of perspective on the movie that I think even made it even better than the the core text of it. And I, we didn't mention this was scene, but I think even the the opening scene oh. of them at the bar, and then the going back to it later, the the scene of them again at the bar, are also two incredible. Uh, yeah, that moments. opening scene is such a great hook. So smart. It's it's like wow, like it's it's so good. Oh, I just and, really and she based it on her her actually being in that situation with a childhood friend from Korea, and her. Mm. Uh, white husband mm. and thinking to herself if somebody else was in at this bar if somebody else was looking at us they would have no idea what our relationship would be with each other <laughs> yeah. there's no clue what would they guess exactly so it's so cool that she kind of made that the, the hook in fact I think even if I remember correctly even the bar that they're in is the one that she had that thought in originally so she went back to that to same that bar, bar to, oh, to shoot cool. that film, awesome. uh, to shoot that scene, which is which is great. So, really impressive, like vision work. Yeah, I, Past Lives is a just such a wonderful movie, and really, I don't know, it's it's so just real. Like it doesn't it doesn't try to get a little too crazy with the the mellow dramatics of things, and I appreciate that. I, I like how just like these are like just good people like real good people communicating and and it, it doesn't get like it's not like <gasps> you know it's just there's no melodrama to it yeah it's just not like silly stupid bullshit like it's a it's like a real movie and it's like a, a real about a real like person like trying to grapple with you know being away from a, you know your home country and and it's it's just deeper than just it being like a love triangle you know so yeah. Miss your thoughts on past lives? I, I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I I also like <laughs> the kind of reality of it. You know, the entire movie you're like, oh, she's gonna dump the husband. She's gonna go run away with her um, childhood boyfriend, and you know, I mean, she even jokes about it in the movie to her husband like no i'm gonna go run away with him like <laughs> they, so i i like that part of it i didn't love the main actress in it um i thought all the other performances were really great but for s something about her felt very much like she was acting on a stage rather than in a film so that was a little jarring to me um Otherwise, I really like the movie. It just isn't my usual go-to type of film. So I could appreciate it, but it wasn't like a movie that I necessarily find super entertaining. 
but I really did, you know, see the quality of the film. Um, I guess for me, it was just the my only like critique was some of the main actresses choices in her performance but other than that i liked it nice. fair nice so now i want to i want to go into a little bit of oscars conversation before we go through our, our sort of like final list of movies for for this year you know obviously uh i'm sure we'll be changing our uh our actual top films list uh, endlessly <laughs> but at least in terms of right now as, as far as this recording to discuss our favorites but first i want to talk about what you guys uh, are expecting from the oscars this year and it feels like things are kind of set in place in terms of what like the, the heavy hitters are and and what uh, mm. what we can expect from you know the the most important performances and the thing and the most important screenplays thing, things like that um do you guys feel like there's there's a lock for what's going to win Best Picture right now? Yeah. Yeah? I think it's going to be Killers of the Flower Moon. Really? Yes. Interesting. Sam, what do you think? I would love for Killers, but I don't... I think it could... I would say the, the most likely choice is Oppenheimer. Just because, I don't know, I, I see... The, the trend just going like all Oppenheimer stuff like Killian wins for best actor Nolan wins best director and Oppenheimer wins best picture maybe a couple other ones in there to like score and I don't know if it'll get screenplay or not but yeah so I, I would say Oppenheimer is the most likely would I rather Killers I don't know because I do love Killers a lot so I think, I mean, I think it's a really great choice because uh, of Flower Moon. I think Oppenheimer has sort of been, in terms of, like, the punditry, has been the uh, the top pick. Um, Miss, I want you to riff a little bit about why you think Killers is the front runner while I uh, set up a sort of master list, so to speak, of, like, what people are thinking is going to be the actual... Uh, nominees i just think that number one the the social message you know the the message of how far or how how far we've come or how far we haven't come in history is important with killers of the flower moon i also think that the oscars like to respect our classic directors a lot i think you know scorsese deserves a best picture win and sometimes the oscars like to to give that to someone not necessarily if it is the best picture or not i think it's a i think it's deserving of best picture but um you know i think i also think that killers of the flower moon is not going to win some of the other categories like best you know best leading actor best director best um sound editing you know best a lot of things so a lot of times when that happens i usually think that best picture so like the whole package together will win the oscar no, i think that, i think that's a great point i have now the uh shout to gold com, which is sort of a, an, an amalgamation of uh, a lot of critics um entering in their predictions i have here the the combination of of odds and the amount of people who predicted uh these nominees for best picture i'm going to give you the 10 i want i want you guys to let me know what you think about it number 10 the zone of interest number nine anatomy of a fall number eight past lives mm. number seven american fiction which is the jeffrey wright film uh number six maestro number five the holdovers four poor things three barbie Number two, Kills of the Flower Moon, and number one, Oppenheimer. Well, we're neck and neck, I guess, you know. Yeah, there's there's a strong amount of people who consider, um, or are predicting Oppenheimer to win. It's around almost like 4,000 predictions versus wow. uh, 928 for Kills of the Flower Moon. And I that's mean, just less from there. For 
for me it's confusing because when I think of what Oppenheimer has on Killers of the Flower Moon, I would say visual effects. But wasn't Oppenheimer not even nominated for that? It's Oppenheimer was not on the short list for visual effects. That's correct. So that's why I'm just thinking it's gonna it'll get a couple things like best actor, probably best director, but I don't think it's gonna sweep best picture. Hmm. Um I think it will get a lot. I think it's just cuz it's it's like that moment, I guess, of of no one of no one's career. I I think a lot of people are are just really high on this movie of being, you know, that that Matt, like Gabe described Oppenheimer as at the beginning of our Oppenheimer podcast as no one's magnum opus. It it really feels like that. I think it's a it's a culmination type of movie. And I don't really think Nolan, you know, like, this is the first type of movie where he's really going to get that recognition at the, from the Academy. So, I mean, like, there's other movies that he's gotten recognition for, but, like, this is, like, that, like, movie movie. You know, like, that biopic. That juicy, good meat. That, that, that tender filet mignon you're, you're cutting and you're slicing and you're saying that's nice and rare and it looks really good, you know. And some of the other ones, the Academy, other Nolan movies, the Academy looks as a nice... Do you see burger? You know, like a Shake Shack burger. Or Five Guys, whatever you're feeling that day. I wanted to see how long he'd go with that. <laughs> I didn't so, break eye contact yeah, the whole no, time. So, so is the holdovers like the Five Guys in this conversation? Or? Holdovers Five Guys? No, he's saying the other Nolan films. Oh, oh yeah, some other Nolan movies. <laughs> I see. Yeah, no, the, the holdovers Sorry. is like, uh, the holdovers is like Panera Bread. <laughs> Oh, I thought you were going to go a like, a, like, a, like an old school uh, throwback kind of Oh, like a pancake chain. in a diner or something? You went to like Denny's or something? True, like it could be like a like a diner egg, two eggs and a pancake type of deal. Why not be three pancakes and egg? Because you get the short shot. Smoke and pancake? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Alright, so so that's... That's the ten. Uh, interesting notes that um, that that's two international film nominees in the in the top ten, which would be. A, I think that's great. A really cool, uh, interesting shift in the norm for the Oscars. I mean, yeah, the the sort of narrative now is that the awards body is a lot more international, which means that uh, a lot there's a lot bigger possibility for movies like these to be considered more seriously in the top 10 uh so i think it's it's very apt that we're seeing both of these movies um in the running uh, otherwise it, it seems like you know kind of the the main like obvious players mm. uh, i guess in terms of interesting omissions uh color purple seemed like a pretty pretty interesting top 10 contender for a while but it seems like it's kind of falling out of the 10 higher claw now. Iron Claw, which which has sort of been like a dark horse, yeah. like everyone loves it, but it's not like taken it's being taken like seriously taken, yeah. in the in the ten. Uh, I think it's a tough year in general. Too. Yeah, this is a lot of a lot of like Oscar stuff, you know, like big statements from big filmmakers, like we were saying, like Bradley Cooper and like Giorgio Santamos mm-hmm. and Scorsese and Nolan. And there's a lot of like big statements like that coming through so i think it's tougher for movies like uh, sean durkin's uh, iron claw to pop out in that way yeah uh may december is being omitted in the top 10 here which seemed like it could come in for a minute there but it might have just been the, the sort of opening into netflix hype of it all not sure uh across the spider verse not getting involved in the mix when the heron not getting involved in the mix uh priscilla is not anywhere close to the 10 uh, air. Oh yeah, air too. Air. Air is a. I movie. rest my case. Well, that, that <laughs> on was, air. Air is like one of those movies. There's a lot of movies this year like that where the uh, the branded movies like um, Flame and Hot Cheetos, Tetris, the Beanie Bubble, the Beanie. Yeah, the Beanie Baby Bubble or the whatever. Beanie bubble. Uh, <laughs> Flaming Hot Cheetos. Yeah, they made a Flame and Hot Cheetos movie. It's literally on called Hulu. Flame and Hot. Yeah, it's the name of the film. Oh. They made a pinball movie. About they made um, the Blackberry one. Like there's Tetris. so many. 
Yeah. Yeah. Weird, weird uh, con- coincidence. Yeah. That there's like 8 million movies about like the, the start of a thing. Yeah, right? <laughs> this year. Rise and Fall. Yeah, no, I don't think. Is there any of those movies in like serious awards consideration? No. Uh, not really. <laughs> not really. What about that movie that was about like the GameStop stock? Oh, Dumb Money. Yeah. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Has not been uh, in any lists anywhere. <laughs> um, did you see that one, Sam? I didn't. I was. I wanted to see it. I just. It never like. I just didn't have like. I didn't have the time. You yeah. Know, so it I, is, I had a similar thing. It, it wasn't like, like something I would want. I was rushing to see. It was like kind of a. It was kind of inconvenient to get to too. Like it didn't go right to a streamer or anything. Yeah. I don't even know if it if it is. At if this it's point. out, yeah, I'm, it's probably digital now somewhere. I I assume so. But, but yeah, for yeah, it's not. It's it's only for rent right now. So yeah, it's that was a weird one. That was yeah. another weird one because <laughs> it was it was the first like COVID movie that wasn't during COVID. Also, mm. yeah, it was. It's odd to have a movie documenting, you know, that that time period. Now it's it's kind of hard to believe. Yeah, it was kind of like Glass Onion still felt relevant in the COVIDness of it, but then true, but now in 2023, it's almost like whoa. Yeah, remember that? <laughs> you know, we could say stuff like that, <laughs> which is crazy. All right. It's time. Let us discuss our top fives of the uh, year. Dun, dun, dun. Five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Uh, Miss, before before we start with your top five, your your number five of the year, is there any uh, films you want to quickly give honorable mention to that didn't quite scratch your top five but are still uh, among your favorite? Um, I would say the short film by Wes Anderson, ah. uh, The Wonderful Story of oh, Henry Sugar. Great pick. Um, I really enjoyed that. A lot. I'm not putting it in my top five because it's a short film, so I think it just falls into a different category. But I thought it was really fun. I'm not usually a big Wes Anderson fan, but I really enjoyed that one. Like, that would be my favorite Wes Anderson Hmm. movie. Over Grand Budapest? I think so. Wow. Um, Interesting. I just really enjoyed it. I thought it was cute. I think maybe that's just the thing, is I can handle Wes Anderson in shorter doses. (laughs) Um... So that would be probably my runner-up. Your number six, basically. Yeah. Okay. All right. So what's your number five? My number five is... I'd say Barbie. (laughs) Okay. Speak on it. (laughs) Um, I put Barbie as my top five, or as my, my fifth out of the top five, because it was pretty much just deciding between Barbie and Oppenheimer as to which one was going to be my fifth, and I think I liked Oppenheimer just a little bit more, because I that's the type of movie I like more. I love anything historical, and, you know, I loved the score, I loved the performances, some of those scenes, like the Bleacher speech scene, are just incredible in Oppenheimer. So for me, those are more memorable mo- moments. You know, I think Barbie was a really fun viewing experience. And in fact, if I'm going to like show somebody a movie from this year, I'm going to play them Barbie. Because I think it's a fun movie to watch with someone. Um, I cried at the end at that, you know, at that one line that they say where us mothers stand still so our daughters come up back and see how far we've uh, they've come so there's some really special moments in Barbie but I would say it's just one peg under Oppenheimer for me there's a really disgusting TikTok that I saw recently of uh, of the, this girl recording some reactions of guys there, there were like three guys that she was showing Barbie to and their faces were like so nonplussed by the whole thing mm. And and frankly, it's just like the perfect encapsulation of like white toxic masculinity that I've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, it was so like 
Just, just like, have fun for, like, two seconds of your life. Did like, they, what are you doing, dude? Did they finally find out that the patriarchy isn't about horses? <laughs> it was, like, honestly, it was, really like, good. so cringe to watch. Because they were, they were, like, so, like, annoyed looking at it. So, like, like it's so goofy and, like, silly and fun and, like, yeah. colorful. Just, like... Lower your shoulders and just like watch the fucking movie. Exactly. You know, don't be afraid to like giggle at it. And I just feel like they had, they're like putting up such like a front. Like, oh, what is this message? It's disgusting. <laughs> you know, uh, sorry, I had to riff on. No, that. I, I had to. I mean, I completely it agree. Bother me <laughs> in that video. <laughs> no, I completely agree. It's it's there's a lot of people I know and. In general, and just people I see online, and it's really, it's a, it's like, I mean, there's social messaging in it, but it's also, it is, it's a silly movie. Like, it's a, it's like a stupid movie sometimes. Like, it's not supposed to be, I don't know. It's just very, I don't know. I, I mean, I think it's a great movie, and the humor I feel like is right up my alley, especially like Ryan Gosling's character, and yeah, they really, the sets are just great. Like the the Barbie world that they create is so incredible design amazing yeah and it's they like didn't you know they put their all into that as well which I'm just really impressed with and I love like all the music like all the songs and just you know I think all the Barbies are just fun and like there's a lot of good lines in it too and uh I get emotional at the end too and I'm I'm a dude and I can admit that that I you know get get emotional at the end of that film which Absolutely. I, you know, as Gabe, you know, as we're talking about now, there's a lot of people that are just a little, you know, they get they get intimidated and this, they create a stigma for themselves because it's, you know, I'm a man, I'm a man. And I need, you know, this movie's attacking my gender, you know, even though the movie is literally making fun of women and men in it, so whatever. <laughs> well put. Well Thank put. you. If you'd like to, if you'd like to continue, Sam, what what is your uh, before you get to your number five? What what's an honorable mention that you have? Um, an honorable mention that I will put will be uh, I'm gonna use my wild card. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'll, I'll do uh, the killer, David Fincher's oh, great choice. movie this year. Great choice. It's really, like, it's kind of a... It feels like a back-to-basics, you know, like, Mank, his last movie, was a lot more different, and, you know, he's using his father's script in that one, Jack Fincher, and I really loved Mank as well, but The Killer felt like... uh, I remember Gabe and I saw it, and, like, his immediate comment was like, wow, he's so angsty. (laughs) And, like, that was, like, exactly how Gabe said it. I I did, that's exactly it. I said it very, like, openly and loudly in the theater. (laughs) So that's, he's an angsty boy. <laughs> but it, it's, it, that's what Fincher does so well. He makes it he angsty. Does. But it's also like, there's like a self-awareness to it. Like, he's not just like being angsty. And it's like, this is what I'm doing. Like, it's, you know, like he's, uh, there's always like the little dark humor in, in the movie. And there's like an elevator scene that I think of uh, with the dark humor in the film. Which I, I was re-watching that scene today. And I was like, this is like a really funny scene. <laughs> like, it's really funny. Um... But yeah, Michael Fassbender, like, he just carries the film. Uh, the way the movie kind of is structured is really fun, so. But my top, my number five is a film that we mentioned already, in terms of my favorite scene, one of my favorite scenes of the year, and that's John Wick, Chapter 4. Mm. Really is just, I remember going to the theater, seeing this, and then in the springtime of this year, and... I was kind of just coming off a string of movies where I, I was going to the theater and seeing them, and I, I was just kind of like, that was fine, or whatnot. And then I remember seeing this, and I came out, and I just, and I, I felt, like, excited. And I was like, that was an action movie that made me, made me want to go out there and, and go be a badass like John Wick. You know, Keanu Reeves is always great. I don't think his acting is, this is probably, like, one of his worst in terms of John Wick's, just because there's some funny line delivery, but... <laughs> but in terms of action, which is what this movie, these movies are always all about, there's so many different set pieces. Like, they go to this location, that location, you get sword fights, you get, like, rainy fights with, you know, this that big dude. I forget who the actor is. He wore, like, prosthetics, but... Yeah, that guy, that guy's amazing. Yeah. He's, uh... 
I'll, I'll try and get. I think name. he's like a Scott stunt. Atkins. Yeah, Scott Atkins. He was that scene was like just so cool and and then obviously like the stairwell fight scene and um, what's his name Donnie Yen in this movie. That's my so, dog right he's there. He's so good. So, so good. good. Bill Skarsgård is a really strong villain in this. You know, he plays that kind of slimy, cowardly villain. Uh, you know, and you got the other ones. Lance Reddick comes back in this. Rust in Peace. Uh, Lawrence Fishburne. Ian, Ian McShane. You know, they're all awesome. You know, and there's... The movie just, you know, is paced really well. I think out of the four John Wick movies, I think this may be my favorite as well. I think... The first one's obviously really good. A second one I like more. And then the third one I think has the most issues. But I think the fourth one kind of reigns it all in. And it's the longest. I mean, it's a long movie. It's uh, nearly three hours. But I never was bored at all. No, it's the closest thing to an action epic that I feel like I've ever seen. Yeah. It, it, it really doesn't feel its length because you're... You're so, like, swept up constantly in the various set pieces. And it, and it, some of them go so long, not in a bad way, but that they, they kind of have their own story arcs in them. Mm-hmm. So you kind of lose sight of the fact that, like, oh, they've been fighting in this area for a very long time. Yeah. <laughs> like, not only does it seem, like, impressively exhausting for the performers, but, and Keanu Reeves, too, among others, but... But it feels like they have their own sort of, like, condensed stories within those sequences, too. Mm -hmm. Which is so impressive and and so cool. You know, along with this sort of overarching story that has uh, been so prevalent throughout all these movies. That's a very great pick. Thank you. (laughs) Uh, For me, my honorable mention, we've we've talked about it a couple times now, so I won't say too much. But uh, Past Lives... Great surprise, uh, wonderful performances, really great writing, and and a uh, and does a really great job of sort of uh, swerving around expectations, uh, zagging instead of uh, zigging. That's a that's a weird it's <laughs> a weird verb. I like that. Um, but my number five is one that we have barely discussed, which is the boy and the heron, the new Hayao Miyazaki film. Cool. Um, Good pick. The more that I've thought about this movie after watching it, the the more love I have for it. Um, especially seeing the English dub, which I'm really glad ended up happening. I wasn't expecting to, to see the dub, but mm. but after looking back on it, I was I felt so happy to to have seen it. Especially um, uh, shout out to the Rolling Tape episode I did where the the gentleman. Uh, Tate that I was talking with had saw, saw it in sub oh, and, I, nice. and I felt like there was an ingredient of his experience actually missing compared to yeah. to the one that I had he wouldn't have had Willem Dafoe Willem Dafoe's cool monologue Robert yeah. Pattinson's Robert insanely Pattinson. insanely good performance like I, I should have mentioned this with the performances of the year but like man the way that he's able to, to channel the kind of insane uh, Japanese voice yeah. acting, but being uh, English is like, oh man, it's, it's, it's a whole nother, whole nother level. <laughs> like it's really, really cool, really impressive. And uh, you know, like I said, the more that I kind of dig into into the storyline of this movie and the um, the sort of uh, traumatic undertones of it, the the more I appreciate and, and love it and obviously it's it's gorgeous and and drawn in such a uh beautiful way that only miyazaki and studio ghibli can do and uh i feel very fortunate that we uh that we have this movie <laughs> because uh it was looking like it might have been over for miyazaki yeah. for a minute but then as he does he was like oh but wait i have this idea and then like six years later he comes out with the movie <laughs> and even now he's like Oh, I have another idea. <laughs> After he announced his retirement again, <laughs> it's a it's a great pick. I mean, that movie definitely marinated on me, and I started to love it a lot more as I thought about it as well. You know, and I did more research on it, and I saw the kind of the parallels with certain characters, and with uh, you know the parallels with the certain characters versus kind of real versus you know Miyazaki himself. 
um, and kind of the, the world he creates and kind of the, the way the first half of the film differs from the second half of the movie is really interesting. And, it, and when I was watching it, it kind of, I was like, uh, but now like looking back, I'm like, I kind of like that there's like two different worlds you get in this movie, like two different kind of Miyazaki worlds. And, and it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's a, it's not my favorite Miyazaki. I, I, I'm, there's some I haven't seen though, so I can't say, but it's, it's really good. Very good pick. I didn't see it. I'm very excited for you to see it. I'm very, very excited for you to see it. Me as well. We just have to fast forward through some scenes. Yeah, I'll, I'll shield your eyes or something. Yeah, it's only the, like that one. The pelican-related violence. Yeah, it's just that, that one's really bad. <laughs> I don't want to see a pelican get hurt. That's fair. It's William Defoe. <laughs> Willem. Willem, sorry. Yeah, where, where's the other A? Willem. Uh, miss, what's your number four? Well, I kind of said it before, um, but my number four is Oppenheimer because, again, it was really just deciding between Barbie and Oppenheimer which one was going to be four or five because they're just so different. It's hard to say one's better than the other, but, again, I think Oppenheimer is just more my cup of tea when it comes to watching a film. Um, you know, I have more fun with Barbie, obviously, but if I'm thinking of, like the mastery of filmmaking and the crazy things that people can do now we were kind of talking about it at the beginning of the podcast about like it's just so cool to see what filmmaking in 2023 looks like and i think oppenheimer is the best example of that um that the performances are amazing you know there's a couple scenes in there that you just can't you can't get out of your head no matter how hard you try when you think about that movie so, I, you know, I have my comments about Oppenheimer. I have some things that I didn't love, like some of the jumpiness and pacing of it wasn't my cup of tea. Uh, the female performances and writing for females in this film is very Nolan, which is also <laughs> not my cup of tea. Uh, Michael Caine wasn't in this film, so immediate minus points. Immediate hell. Um, <laughs> minus star. Minus star for... Oppenheimer <laughs> but yeah I think again if I'm comparing it to other Nolan movies it's not my favorite of his but it's a really wonderful film it's a really important film so I'd say it's my number four I'm sure it will not be the last time we discuss it yeah. on, our, on our list definitely Sam your four my fourth is Past Lives um, which was Gabe's honorable mention and we discussed before. I think uh, all I'll say about this, since we've discussed this movie pretty in length, length, late, lengthfully, lengthily. Is that a term? Is that a word? I think so. Okay. <laughs> um, Let's go with it. Past Lives, I think, is a special movie for me because uh, uh, kind of the theme of the film, in terms of you know, kind of saying goodbye to a chapter in your life, and kind of this. Like I said, past lives, an alternate pathway your life could have taken. Um, I think as a person, you know, like, that's gone through a lot of change in your life, you know. And as I get older, you know, you realize, like, how impactful your decisions are. You know, like, me, I'm a 22-year-old boy right now. And, uh, you know, like, I'm picking where I wanted, what I want to do next in life and where I want to go. And, and even, like when I was in college, you know, I recently graduated, but, you know, like, I realized in college, like, the decisions I'm making are gonna impact everything else, and, like, you know, I could, making this decision is saying goodbye to another decision, and I think this movie explores that, obviously, in, in kind of the romantic light, but also in kind of that, like, moving away from home light, um, which I relate to, and I, I think, you know, this movie... Just had a, had a profound effect on me because it was able to process those emotions in a way that was especially you know in that final scene that gave you discuss we you know discussed all that catharsis comes through in that in that final scene of all those emotions processing and and uh, you know I just also love the way the movie kind of divides itself starts kind of when they're they're kids and then you know they get older and you know. And I, I love the performances. I think Greta Lee is really fantastic in this. Um, uh, what, the character, uh, the actor that plays Hey Sung, 
was really great in this. And uh, John Magaro as well. Also really good. I, I He just kind of keeps popping up on things that I've been watching. and <laughs> Like he was in Showing Up too with directed by Kelly Reichardt. He was really good in, in a smaller role. But, you know, and it's just uh, it's a very nuanced and realistic movie on this this topic and that that's something that always speaks to me as well so that's my number my number four that's a great great encapsulation of sort of the what seems to be the intent message of the movie and definitely something that it it deals with in a, in a really beautiful way i i think that was uh very well articulated um and a good way to, to end off sort of the discussion about the film on, a, on this VOD, as we've discussed it multiple times. Um, number four for me is the zone of interest. I'll keep it, uh, I'll keep it brief just because uh, none of my co-hosts have actually seen this film. Uh, I'll just say it's, um, it's an incredible, incredible piece of work that I think constantly plays with with the in- inherent tension of its premise and it it really manipulates you in like the best way mm. i i i found it to be surprisingly watchable also which is very odd for me to say you know there's certainly like a an air of real like dread to it and horror and and things like that for anyone that uh, that's unfamiliar with the film it's a it's about a uh, a German family. One of the the father being a, a Nazi officer, and they live directly outside of Auschwitz. They share a wall. Oh, that's, that's crazy. Um, so so that that premise alone is insane, and the movie really capitalizes on that premise. Very very stylized, very effective. Uh, one of the most amazing things about the movie to me is the way that the sound of the film is basically a different movie. Uh, I'll, I'll you know keep that sort of yeah. general, <laughs> just because I, I want you guys to, to keep the experience uh, <laughs> honest when you see it. But Do any children or animals die? Not visibly. Ah. Part of the uh, part of the the inherent insanity of the film, yeah. <laughs> the the sort of like hysteria of it. There is a whole different movie going on in the background of this film uh, that uh, that isn't always shown. So, highly recommend. Uh, highly recommend. Yeah, I'm very, interest uh, if, if you can stomach this sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm very. Uh, I'm not gonna say excited to see a movie about the Holocaust, but interesting. Yeah, very, very interested, intrigued, and in, and in seeing this, you know, from what you've said about it and. And what I've what I've read about the film, it's you know Jonathan Glazer is also not really like someone that makes movies often. I think his last movie was Under the Skin, was it? I think. Yeah. So that was that was, was nearly ten years ago. So <laughs> you know when a director kind of takes that long to release something, and it also makes it kind of a, a special occasion. So I'm very excited. I'm not excited. <laughs> You're anticipating. I'm anticipating it. <laughs> Miss, what is your number three? My number three is Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. That's my number number three. three. Oh, wow. Do we all have the same one? No. (laughs) My uh, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse shows up as number nine on my list. Oh, wow. It's way lower. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But but that's okay. Continue. Um, I think, you know, kind of like the Mario movie. I went in expecting a good movie because the first one was really good, but I thought that this was a really great sequel, and to me that bumps it up because I am not a person that usually likes a sequel. So the fact that it was as amazing as it was just shows me that it deserves a top spot. I thought that all of the voice actors kind of, you know, between the last movie and this one kind of found their characters and really dug into it and the emotion came out um uh oscar isaac is just awesome can do no wrong he really man. can do no wrong yeah. <laughs> and One of those. yeah he's just so good and <laughs> i i think you know 
all of the also nostalgia in this film even though it's not as nostalgic i'd say it's you know you kind of look at it and you go oh you know like the little easter eggs that you find mm. when you go to like the world of all the spiders and i just i really enjoyed it again it was you know what i say it's like cinema quality like killers of the flower moon or oppenheimer no but it's a really well-made movie. It's really fun. Marvel needed it. Uh, I guess Sony too. <laughs> and so, sure, Sony needed yeah. it. <laughs> they always use it. <laughs> yeah, and I, I just really enjoyed it a lot. So Sammy said this is also number three. Yeah, uh, I love this movie. It's a, I think it's a perfect sequel. It expands on Into the Spider-Verse really well by giving you even more Spider-Man related content, more you know easter eggs and hidden things and it's also uh you know it's got a lot of uh great voice performances i mean like missy said i do think that the voice acting is even better in this movie and you also have like newer people like um daniel kaluuya in it and um i mean he's like the main one i could think of but he's really really just the uh, notable oh, and jason schwartzman yeah as jason the villain schwartzman, oscar isaac that messi mentioned oh yes uh, oscar isaac yeah Issa ray is very good so th- those are it's it's really cool and uh it's just such a fun movie like the animation just pops off so hard like it just well, goes it. so Fucking hard sick, man. they just it's like all of these people i don't know i picture like just like these mad scientists sitting in front of these computers just like creating magic with their yeah, hands and it's real. just it's it's crazy what people can do and to think that there was a whole debacle with you know these graphic designers and these visual effects artists that were underpaid and overworked and all of that in marvel that they still created this afterwards yeah. i hope it was under better conditions but they just absolutely destroyed it in such a good way and i think you know for this movie and the mario movie i think it's just i would define these movies as a celebration mm. a celebration of spider-man a ce- celebration of nintendo they're just celebrations of really important pieces of what I would say are starting to become our history. So, no. or at least media history. Yeah, yeah, well, so, his- yeah, of course. Cultural history. Cultural, cultural yeah. history, sure. But I, I really just love the fact that we can now make movies that really beautifully and tastefully celebrate these really important parts of our childhood. Yeah. yeah, in a way that's not pandering or or sort of reductive in any way, you know, th- yeah. th- things like that, which it easily uh, easily could be, and has and has shown to yeah. be in the wrong hands. See, like any live action rendition of a video game or true uh, or Disney uh, animated film. Ever. Yeah. <laughs> also, one more thing about Across the Spider Verse. Uh, People that don't like this movie or have, or not don't like this movie, but people that have an issue with this movie being a cliffhanger, it's stupid. It's dumb. I think people, I think people went into it. That's just an expectation thing. You need to look at the movie now as a whole. Months later, now rewatch the movie. Now that you know that's a cliffhanger, and just judge the movie as a film, and not by you're expecting it to have an actual ending. That's yeah, just my I mean, opinion. It really is. It's Empire Strike Back. Yeah, like what, what's wrong? I think cliffhangers are great. I'm sorry you have to wait in, uh, two years to see a movie. Oh, gosh. Yeah, that's just a patience problem. Yeah, like, mm-hmm. have some patience. Why don't you just, oh, watch other movies before then? <laughs> <laughs> Tell them how you really feel, Sam. I'm yeah. pissed. I'm, I'm pissed about this. this. All these TikTok kids, just, just pull, pull your phone back up, child. You're going to do it anyway, so, you know, just go, go distract yourself somewhere else. Who cares? Yeah, go take your iPad and screw. Yeah, there was a the whole bunch of kids in my showing of that movie when i saw in theaters that like really exactly exactly buddy really exuded that kind of energy like you know we we sat through this movie already but now we're gonna go like ruin everybody else's time yeah talking through the whole thing and like fucking around and i'm like responding to fucking lines of dialogue (laughs) it kills me i had the same exact theater experience when i saw it too it was they were just extremely loud and what obnoxious. Ha- like, what so happened? 
I don't know. I feel I, like I we're just know. on a real... I don't know if it was COVID or if it's like children giving less of a shit about social etiquette when yeah. they're not with their parents. Like, it, it, there's something very odd going on. <laughs> I just... I don't like it. It's not good. Yeah, I don't like it. Even... It's not even even kids either. There's there's plenty of adults too that I've seen that are just like obnoxious and like on their phones or, or groaning and like... Mm. True. There's a lot of bodily functions that are happening loudly and aggressively in theaters yeah. that should not be. Low attention Our cat is fans. popping off right now. <laughs> he really wants to get in that garage. <laughs> um, my number three, that's our, our introduction into talking about this movie, I guess, is Killers of the Flower Moon. Okay. I... <laughs> I, Riku. My <laughs> That's my number two, so Okay. My my son agrees. Um This this is a really honestly, this is a pretty surprising movie in, in a way that I expected it to be good, but I expected a very different kind of movie. Um I I should have because a lot of uh Scorsese's best work and like most notable work has been making the antagonist characters kind of front and center and sort of like the guiding force in, of the movie in the way that the protagonist usually is. Uh, I think this movie weaponizes it as good as any Scorsese movie ever has. Mm. And and it, that, that really struck me um, the first time in a, in a really effective way up until, up until the very end of the film, which... Uh, I won't spoil because the the ending sequence, uh, sort of like epilogue of this yeah. movie is amazing. It really is. Uh, yeah, it's worth watching just for genius, that. That's genius. Long. Yeah. Uh, as we discussed previously, all the the performances of, in this movie are amazing. Uh, that that was a fork. Uh, there it goes again. All the performances are amazing. <laughs> the the writing is fantastic. From. Uh, Scorsese and Josh Singer himself, um, the or Eric Roth. I'm sorry, Josh Singer uh, co-wrote Maestro with <laughs> Bradley Cooper. <laughs> I mixed the the two. Yeah, I was uh, like, I was like, I, I've I've heard of the the Singer name, but I was, I was not the right. <laughs> yes, I, I mixed them up. I apologize. Eric Roth and Scorsese, mm. uh, their their writing and a, a, adapting of this story, and the decision to make it less of a conversation about the FBI investigation and more about the, the Osage experience was a masterstroke decision. That Wasn't that Leo? Uh, the story goes that DiCaprio wanted to play the... Uh, Ernest? Ernest, instead of the FBI agent that Jesse Plemons ends up playing. So they essentially swapped roles in the movie. Okay. And for that reason, they shifted the focus. Oh. To make uh, to put DiCaprio back in sort of like the lead position. So originally the movie was about the FBI agent. Correct. But they switched it so then it ended up being about Ernest. Yeah, and it makes when you think about sort of like the progression of the film, it does not unravel conventionally. If it was about the FBI investigation, I think it would be a lot more of like a mystery that unravels over the course of time. Mm-hmm. But this movie, like. It's clear as day, and I think it, it's so smart yeah. the way that it does that. Well, the, and it's more Scorsese, like you said. It puts the villain in the front and center. Right, absolutely. Uh, Sam, we'll give you time to talk about the movie when we when we loop back around. Uh, but, Miss, are we at your number two now? We are at my number two. Oh my goodness. Go <laughs> ahead. And I'm not going to follow my letterbox ratings. Oh! <gasps> She's well, going off surprise script. pick. My God. What? So I'm going to put number two as the Super Mario Bros. Movie. Oh. Wow. I know this you is thought a pivot. I, I know you thought I'd put I thought it, it was going to be number one. I know you thought that, but <laughs> I'm, here, I'm here to shock and surprise our massive audience. Good podcast. <laughs> this is crazy. And, <laughs> I ate my Christmas dinner leftovers while we were going over our top five, and I feel a burst of energy. Yeah, Missy got so bored listening to Sammy talk about his <laughs> she, that she went to go make a second dinner for herself and ate it like, Fuck in the middle of the conversation. Movie. I have to hear about past lives one more time. I hadn't seen some of the movies 
things that you talked about. So I was like, I guess now's a good time. Oh, God. But um, <laughs> I put the Super Mario Bros. movie at number two because, you know, like I was talking about earlier in the podcast, it's been a long time since I've had that much fun in a movie theater. And, you know, it just the whole experience was great. I mean, Gabe and I went to see it together, which always makes seeing a movie really fun and special. And, you know, like he said, ever like right from the start with the little Nintendo intro of bum 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 bum, bum it's just it just does something and it, that nostalgia just kind of like slowly creeps out of you and again it's just a celebration of something that was really important to our generation as children and to me as somebody who grew up playing those games and I thought the music was unbelievable. The use of music was crazy in this movie. Yeah, we're way- ta- we're talking about the this the score, not the soundtrack. By the way, the the soundtrack, uh, yeah, it's different. Yeah, the soundtrack's different. I'm talking about <laughs> I'm talking about the way the composer um, had his different arrangements <laughs> of the famous Super Mario themes. Or dog, or categories. You know, like Rainbow Road popping in there. That's you know, a great. That's a great moment. The yeah. superstar theme. Like there were just like such crazy moments where the music just overwhelmed me because I loved it so much. Yeah, shout out so, to Brian Tyler and uh, Koji Kondo working together and really was, putting together something really cool. It was beautiful, and I really. I mean, Gabe and I listened to the soundtrack or the score to this movie many times in the car afterwards just so we could listen to it and relive it again so i put that movie at number two mostly just because of my experience being in the theater and i think we can give movie theater experiences a big part of our ratings thank you riku (laughs) he's very passionate about the mario movie as well (laughs) he watched on peacock that's because he's just a little goomba here he comes here he comes it's like, right, did you guys finish like, talking about the Mario movie? <laughs> Am I late? Hello. Can I, can I talk about the the Luma? Luma. <laughs> the existential dread the Luma. The existential Luma. <laughs> um, Sam, your number two is, is Killers. Killers of the Flower Moon. Yeah, Killers of Flower Moon. Definitely one of my most anticipated movies of this year. Oh, sure. With Martin Scorsese. Oh, yeah. You know, this that image of, of him at the table with with Lily Gladstone, was yeah. like I was. I just saw that photo for like two years, and I was like, I was like, when is this movie coming out? Like, I'm, right, I'm ready. ready. Yeah. Crazy. And we saw that movie together. We did. Missy and I saw it, and uh, I think we both were really impressed by it after leaving. Like I so said, I, the ending of this film, you know, it's definitely something that most people, most of the discourse around this film, have said is is great, and but it really can't be understated that the ending is one of my favorite endings I've seen in a movie in a very long time. Just the layers to it, you know, not only like its purpose of making it kind of a, a different type of ending to a historical film, but also, you know, the, the, the deeper purpose within it, that, that subtext of, of Scorsese as a, as a director and his legacy as a director. You know, he he's really such an amazing creator of films and he just doesn't stop being great you know he just has this he's entered this period of his career where it's kind of just more like meditative and it's there's a lot more you know introspection in it uh and i think that started a lot with you know even the irishman and this movie too there's just both movies are are follow that suit of just being kind of brutal and the violence is a lot more Serious. It's not even that's. <laughs> Riku's just agreeing with everything I say. You know? Yeah, he, he really likes our lists. I think. <laughs> I think he really likes Keller's The Flower Moon. Mm. I think he's yelling, "Daddy, change the litter box." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna have to wait, pal. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, 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 so, killers. you know, he's, <laughs> killers, the violence, like, the violence in this movie is actually, it's just, it's really just devastating to watch, uh, seeing these people, and, you know, like, 
like it was mentioned with you know adapting this this book shifting the focus away from the investigation you really are just kind of living in this this hell that the the osage um people are dealing with and and you know they're unaware of the of the you know evil forces that are under their nose basically and and you know the sad fact of kind of when this investigation you know portion begins the movie even gets more sad and you know upsetting and in terms of just you know the the obviousness of these crimes and and all that and and jesse plemons coming through he's such an amazing performer he's one of my favorite kind of supporting role players now and leo's amazing gladstone is is awesome and and de niro de niro's terror just completely terrifying and just a complete sociopath and <laughs> it's really haunting honestly so uh yeah good encapsulation of that film uh my number two is oppenheimer we discussed it a million times uh <laughs> we're gonna discuss it a million more times did we talk probably. about it like on a podcast did we talk about that movie well, well, what I was going to say was my only comment now, putting it at number two, is uh, go listen to our long podcast <laughs> about the movie where I go into excruciating detail <laughs> about every machination of the film. <laughs> for good reason. And for, and, for, and for reasons. Yeah, it's it's great. Um, I also want to say quickly about Killers of Flying Room before I forget. Uh, my hot take about that movie is I think Brendan Fraser is good in it. Brendan Fraser is good? Yeah, he's good in it. He's fine. <laughs> Missy's given the Miss, death what's stare. your... What's your... Oh, wait. Actually, before we get to number one, so I want to do something funny. Um, <laughs> what is your guys' least favorite movie from this year? Uh, I feel like we already did that. Did we? Well, we did Disappointing Movie. Disappointing. I, I have a separate. Yeah. Okay. I also have a separate one. I think Missy's was that one that was a No Hard Feelings. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. That was your least favorite film of the year? Worst movie of the year. Oh, interesting. Okay, Sam, what was your least favorite? My least favorite movie? <laughs> I saw this in the theater with, with my friend, and uh, this movie is really just... <laughs> Me too, honey. He's getting, he's getting louder. <laughs> this movie is really terrible. Like I, <laughs> I, I thought it would be, like, fun. I thought it would be, like, a mid, like... Me, you know, a mediocre, just kind of fun action movie. <laughs> yeah. But the the Equalizer three was really not good. Like, really, it was, it was really not good. Like Denzel um, was just kind of, he's just kind of there, and you know, and but the the plot is just so boring. Like, like he just goes to Italy, and then there's like dudes there that are like mean. Like the, he like Denzel goes to Italy, and he like befriends like the town and like people in the town and the community. And then there's, like, gangsters, like, evil mobster, Italian mobsters there that come and, like, you know, and then he just basically kills them and, you know, and... <laughs> equalizes yeah, them. Yeah, he equalizes them. <laughs> but, like, it's just, like, that's just all that happens. Like, they, they, they're terrorizing the town and then he's like, I'm gonna kill you. I, I have suffered. I have, I have bled. I, like, he does, like, this whole weird, like, Denzel, like, crazy monologue. Like, he's, he's fun, though. He's great. But yeah, this movie's poop. <laughs> I didn't even know that movie came out. Yeah, yeah it was, it most was people a decent, didn't know. Uh, it was a decent box office. He goes like two C's, two L's. And then, like the dialogue, like they try to make the dialogue so. Oh yes, God. we heard you, Riku. We heard you. Jesus, what's your worst, Gabe? Uh, my least favorite film of this year is <laughs> Spy Kids. No, you were gonna oh, no. say that. I I had no. Uh, listen, the expectations were clear. But this movie's poopy doo doo, <laughs> cock out garbage, silly nonsense. Every performance is bad. <laughs> every every computer generated image is bad. It's all made by Robert Rodriguez, so I get it. I understand. It still doesn't change the fact that this movie's not good. But the power of family game. Zachary Levi. They've made three other movies with that same message, like we get it <laughs> this movie doesn't change like it doesn't add a spin to like what already made the spy kids movies like quote unquote interesting is the original two in it no they're not in it no no oh, that sucks <laughs> it the, it's new children uh and then zachary levi and gina rodriguez play the 
uh, parents. And they're they're also poo poo doo doo caca stinky duty <laughs> in this movie is very bad. Well, Miss, why were you why were you upset that I said Spy Kids? You liked No Hard Feelings better than Spy Kids. Yeah. Ugh. <laughs> I like what the the top review on Letterbox for the Spy Kids movie is a quote from Zachary Levi. Yeah. Where he said, I personally feel like the amount of content that comes out of Hollywood is garbage. They don't care enough to actually make it great for you guys. And that's pretty funny. Oh. Huh. That's just me that's just me hating on Zachary Levi because it's kind hey, of hypocritical. I performed at Carnegie Hall with Zachary Levi. Yeah, and look at how well that turned out. He didn't for know him. I was there, but I was in the orchestra behind him. <laughs> you were shazamming. I was shazamming. That's right. Uh, all right, Miss. Well, now that all that's out of the way, let's get down to brass tacks. Your number one favorite film of 2023 is... Killers of the Flower Moon. Oh, I thought we were done talking about the movie. I'm so sorry. I know. <laughs> you should have said something. Me. The but betrayal. It, but I was trying to... <laughs> you're trying to make it dramatic. Yeah, you're trying to build up to it. Yeah, with the number I'm one. So, I'm so trying sorry. to give good content. I'm always down to talk more about this movie, though. Um... Well, number one, again, it was fun to go see it with Sam in the theater. And I think that this, I mean, listeners of our podcast would know that I don't like children or animal deaths. This movie covered both of those bases. So it's pretty shocking that I, re- that I love this movie as much as I do. But the fact that it has both child and animal death in it, and I like it, you know, a whole lot, says enough. And I think the performances are just breathtaking. Some of the scenes, they just don't leave your head, like uh, when the house blows up. That whole scene, the performers, the looks, Mm. like everything when he goes back and tells Lily Gladstone about it, like it just... The performances are undeniably amazing, and I think that that's where it has a leg up over Oppenheimer for me, is I loved the performances much more. So, and I, honestly, I just think it's a altogether better movie personally, but I think it was a really, really good representation of a Scorsese film, because again, I'm not a big mob movie kind of girl so this movie kind of hit the bases that work for me for Scorsese and De Niro just you know really knows how to capture my heart (laughs) in these movies not capture my heart as in loving his character his characters are terrible people more like literally capture your heart in a cage and like stab it with a stick yeah that's probably more accurate (laughs) to his character but it's you know, it's it's a real lesson, this movie, for people who are aspiring filmmakers, aspiring actors, aspiring anything in, you know, in media. I think this is a really good oh. lesson in how to do that. Scorsese's just somebody to learn from, and all of these actors are just classics, like, you know, Leo and De Niro. They're just unbelievable, and... You know, I, I gave this movie four stars. So it's, you know, it's got some things about it, such as Brendan Fraser. So I don't agree with uh, Gates Hot <laughs> Take. Brendan Fraser, Brendan. I didn't, like, why was he there? Some of those courtroom performances were not it for me. In fact, I really didn't like the courtroom scenes, period. Mm. But I really did enjoy this movie a lot. And I think that it's very deserving of best film at the Oscars if it does win it. And I think these actors deserve to be praised and celebrated for their performances. That's a great pick. Yeah. That's a great pick. Obviously, we, we all three of us really love that movie. Uh, our dog wants to be let outside to pee, so he rings his bells. That's uh, that's what was... Uh, oh, now he's going to bed. He, he has literally left the room and is now going to our bedroom. Good night, Cloud. <laughs> I, guess, I guess he gave up on peeing. Um, Sam, your number one favorite film of 2023 is... Oh, he's back. It's Creed 3. Wow. No, no, it's not Creed 3. (laughs) Zagging. Uh, Yeah, you didn't believe that for a second. No. Um, 
that's uh, Oppenheimer. Um, I'm not going to say much because, like I said, we did discuss this movie <laughs> for nearly three hours. Yes. But uh, it's definitely just a movie that I think hit all the things that I, I love about a film in terms of, you know, the script is written in first person. I love films that just try to capture the mood and perspective of a character, you know. And Nolan's always been good at that, but I feel like he just, like, perfects it in this film, especially with certain scenes where you just are completely immersed in his perspective, the, 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 the viewpoint of this, you know, man with so much on his shoulders and the grave burden he has to carry for his life. And, you know, it's a typical Nolan protagonist, but I think in the historical context, it's, it's super compelling. And, uh, yeah, you can hear more about my thoughts on, on the Oppenheimer podcast, though. But I love this movie. I'd probably watch it, like, a billion more times. I don't care that it's three hours. I'd watch it, like, every day. Like, it's, it's so good. Yeah, it, do, it really doesn't f- feel its length in the slightest. It's not. It really doesn't. It's a, I mean, it breezes. I, it's, a, it's a real testament to Kills of Flower Moon and Oppenheimer for both being over three hours that it neither of them feel that length at all yeah and i'm so glad that a movie like oppenheimer has made the amount of money that it did given that it's a you know it's a it's a very artistic long film biopic but was still able to make almost a billion dollars yeah in 2023 so impressive and it's really cool really cool yeah it really is cool as a film lover that other people are just as excited about this movie it's it's very uh it's very exciting to see that kind of development okay what's so your, uh, what's your top here my number one film i this was through much deliberation okay. as i mentioned my top 10 has like shuffled around a million times <laughs> in the past couple days alone mm. let alone the the rest of the, the year <laughs> but for me my number one favorite film of 2023 as of right now i should say is asteroid city okay uh, we haven't really talked about that one we have not talked well, about this talked film about and, I, and i purposefully haven't really mentioned it before this because I wanted to come in fresh with my thoughts that's, that's a nice surprise yeah, yeah i sort of banked on no one else saying anything about it <laughs> So, why do I love this movie so much? Man, I mean, it's it it's the perfect encapsulation of what I find so entertaining and, and gripping about Wes Anderson's films. The absurd, hilarious specificity of it all. The eclectic characters. The set design. The costume design. Everything working in such beautiful harmony together. Performances that stand out but are just as much the tapestry of the of the work as it is you know performance as a separate piece of the work um in terms of the text of this movie i love i personally love the uh story within a story nature of this Mm -hmm. movie uh i i find that it there's ways to read into it in a way that uh, that might sound kind of goofy and and ridiculous but but for me feel really profound and beautiful um and can can expand to something like talking about life itself yeah in a way there's a lot to attach to this movie i agree aside from it just being you know a fun pleasant story that has undertones of 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 trauma and grief and loss and I think it's told in a really beautiful way, but never overstated. Um, more so just hinted at and kind of uh, discussed in brief over the course of the movie that I think is, is so smart. It's a very funny movie, too. It's There's a lot of funny. charm and, and humor that I think would uh, anybody familiar with Wes Anderson would be accustomed to. But I think he, he really has... Uh, has hit a, a certain register with this movie that um, that feels like among his best. So that's why uh, that's why it is right now my favorite film of this year. You love music. Oh, the music! He looks good. Desplat. Yeah. So it's a good, well. such a good pairing. 
and uh, and also I I didn't you know for for the reasons I just mentioned I I didn't want to mention uh, one of my other favorite scenes of this year which is the first uh, alien sighting oh yeah it's so funny oh my god I could watch that scene every day for the rest of my life and be happy <laughs> he listens to the soundtrack in the car I do for that scene. I, I do I listen to the, the freight train song and I listen to that specific part of the, the score all the time because it's just so it's so whimsical and it's so fun but it's also like beautifully explorative and makes you think of like looking up at the stars and thinking about uh you know all the possibilities of of life out there and life here and yeah the movie just makes just invokes so many feelings in me along with being just a really entertaining ride that i can't help but uh but pick it also it feels like everybody in the film performance wise brings exactly what they should and, and it's just a collection of some of my favorite actors in general. Yeah. Brian, Can- Brian Cranston, Steve Carell, Jeffrey Wright, Tilda Swin. Tom Hanks is good, really good in this. Tom Hanks is really good in it. Schwartzman's great in it. Scarlett Johansson's amazing in the yeah. movie. Maya Hawk. Maya Hawk is yeah. great. Uh, Sophie Lillis popping in, being, mm-hmm. being great. There's just so many, so many pieces of this movie that Jeff come Goldblum. together. <laughs> Gold Blue is so He is great. Oh my god, so good. Um Margo. Willem Dafoe again popping in real. Yeah, Margo's in it. Margo is in it. Oh my god, the Margo scene. That's, That's one, one of the best your, like, visually Oh magnifique. Yeah. Definitely one of the best scenes in the movie. Yes. Yeah, that's sh- right. Oh, I'm sorry, the, the last no, thing I'll go. say. The the shot of her face on Mm-hmm. In that in that last sequence with her and Schwartzman is uh, one of my favorite images that has come out of uh, a film this year. Yeah, yeah, Gabe has a big crush on Margo. <laughs> She's a pretty lady. She's a pretty girl. Right? Go ahead. Sam. Yeah, no, Asteroid City is <laughs> a great movie. I, I think I love weird. I love when Wes Anderson be, can be so inaccessible. I actually love when he goes down that kind of route. I think, like, one of my favorite Wes Anderson movies is Life Aquatic of uh, Steve Zissou, which I think is such a... one of his weirder and movies that's a kind of harder to get into, and I like when he goes that that direction. So Asteroid City is, you know, it can be super, like, convoluted and confusing at times, but I kind of love th- that the movie does that because it's it feels like it's kind of like this is for Wes, Wes Anderson fans. Like, this movie... And I also feel like it's him, like, responding to the stupid TikToks of, like... You know, like, those, like, TikTok trend that came out where it's, like, everyone's doing the Wes Anderson thing. And he's, like, Let's, he's like no, I, I, I can do Wes Anderson. <laughs> like, that's my thing. Like, like stop taking my shit, you know. Um, yeah, it's a really, really wonderful film. It's something that, uh, it definitely was another marinator. And I really want to rewatch it because I only saw it once. But uh, I want to watch it a second time because I think there's, there's just so much content in that movie and a lot to, to pluck from. And, uh, yeah, it is streaming now on Prime Video, so it is it is readily available. Yeah, which is awesome. All right, well, that was that was a really great thorough sort of investigation on 2023 and the movies that came out in it. Um, in terms of bonus episodes like this covering sort of more current uh, conversations, we will be uh, doing a, a similar thing when the when the Oscars are sort of kicking into gear, you know, I'm definitely interested in doing sort of like a predictions podcast, but mm. also obviously a reactions to winners. Oh yeah. So we got, uh, we got some stuff in the pipeline for, for that when the time comes, but in the meantime, we'll be continuing with our regularly scheduled mini series on the films of, uh, Frank Capra, Greta Gerwig, Guillermo del Toro, and last but not least, Charlie Kaufman. So be on the lookout for, for those as they get released. But in the meantime, I hope you all enjoyed this conversation on the films of 2023. There's uh, so many that we we didn't cover, didn't touch on enough, but, you know, there's only so much time in the day, and it's already quite late. And uh, there's only so much of Cloud's farts that we can handle in one sitting. Very true. So, I think it's about time to send it off. Is is there any uh, final 2023 notes that you guys would like to say to our audience? Um... 
Any life lessons of uh, life 2022? Life lessons. <laughs> <laughs> when I cap off. It was, a good, it was a really good year in movies. I thought last year was really good, but I, I think this might have even been better. Um, uh, I was really uh, pleasantly surprised. I didn't, I didn't know what to expect, but... You know the summer. The summer was decent, but I think the fall and the fall really came through in winter with movies. I would just say I I hope we can find another Barbenheimer phenomenon for twenty twenty four so that we can pe- keep people excited to go to the movie theater. Yeah, I hope I hope there's something. I'm trying to think of like what's in the pipeline, but I it's that was such an organic thing that I feel like. It'll probably, if if anything, it would be something similar that just kind of like pops up out of the woodwork and becomes this this big deal. I mean, I hope I hope that happens. I would love for it to happen. Yeah, we here at uh, Lily House uh, love ourselves some cinema. Love to cinema. see the business uh, thrive in a way that uh, allows artists to create art in in a way that is uncompromising and. And speaks to uh, the talent of the people working on it, and I think there was a lot of films this year that that had that. Yeah, for sure. And on that note, Happy New Year! I hope you all had uh, a great time at the movies in 2023, like we did. And here's hoping that 2024 uh, continues a streak of solid years in film. Uh, I hope you'll stick around with us uh, through that adventure and moving forward. If, if you're out there <laughs> in the meantime happy new year and good night from lily house bless up bless up <laughs> <laughs>